last day of the uh, Knox Biennial. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce you Uga Abachi from the Pennsylvania State University. And the title of his talk is Kant and the Possibility of the Sublime in Art. Okay, do you do you hear me? You hear me? Do you hear me? All right. Volume. 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 Or, or just project. Uh, I mean, I'm allowed yeah. now. How about how about now? Uh, all right. Uh, <laughs> all right. So I'm I'm gonna start with the with a story of this as paper. Um. So uh, it's a bit funny actually. Uh. So first time I uh, was engaged with uh, this topic was uh, early in my uh, grad school years. Um, so I was taking a class uh, on 18th century aesthetics and Robert was uh, sitting in uh, on that class. <laughs> so I, uh, I noticed something uh, in the third critique uh, that was a gap that I will actually mention uh, in this talk. Uh, and you know, I, I, I'm a big believer in uh, Kant's architectonic obsessions. So there was, there was something missing in the third critique. So that uh, got me uh, uh, thinking um, on this on this topic. Then I wrote a paper. It was actually a term paper. Then uh, somehow it got published. Uh, and Robert, uh, who was uh, sitting in on that class, wrote a response to that uh, paper. Uh, and I wrote a response to that response. Uh, so this, this little back and forth between me and Robert, uh, uh, well, it was the beginning of a, a beautiful friendship, but also uh, we kind of set the stage for uh, uh, the literature on this very question for the next you know, one and a half decade. Um, and last summer we uh, were invited to a conference in Jena so that kind of motivated me to revisit some of my thoughts. Uh, I would say I softened up a little bit uh, uh, on my original position, uh, but it's, uh, uh, let's see how, how uh, uh, I changed uh, my position a little bit. Um, okay, so uh, there's the handout. I hate to read the paper, but I think I'll have to given uh, the time constraint. Um, and I'll be referring to the handout when uh, uh, necessary. So Kant's theory of the sublime has enjoyed an immense amount of interest in the literature, especially in the last three decades, roughly since the first book length treatments of the topic by Paul Crother and Jean-Francois Lyotard. One question that has received increasing attention is whether Kant's theory accommodates or can accommodate the possibility of artworks eliciting the experience of the sublime. This question is naturally motivated by the curious lack of an account of artistic sublimity in Kant's primary aesthetic treatise, that's the uh, critic of pure reason. So there is the uh, natural sublime uh, and the beautiful art, but there is no account of uh, um, artistic sublime, as, 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 at least that's how I read it. Um, so while some scholars have argued that Kant is indeed justified in not offering an account of artistic sublimity in the critique, because his respective theories of the sublime and art significantly problematize the very possibility of a Kantian artistic sublime. And that includes me and Emily Brady. Others have uh, offered various accounts, various ways in which a case for a Kantian artistic sublime can be made. And that includes Robert uh, and, and Paul Geyer and uh, uh, Moise Kuplan and some others. Uh, so actually the majority view is that there must be some room for artistic sublime, uh, a Kantian artistic sublime. So in this paper, I intend to engage with this ongoing discussion and offer a nuanced position, which both recognizing the chat, which, which both recognizes the challenge that specific textual and philosophical problems for, for a genuinely Kantian artistic sublime and delineates a conceptual room, albeit constrained for the latter. Uh, so if you look at the handout, uh, um, so this was my introduction. The first section is a, a clarification of what the question is, because I think the question uh, uh, can get misunderstood. Uh, the second sex, uh, section will uh, lay out the problems that I have in mind for a Kantian artistic sublimity. 
The third, uh, what interpretive options we might have in light of these problems. The fourth section, uh, the fourth and fifth sections are about um, a positive account of artistic sublimity in the literature, which I take to be the best uh, attempt. Um, and I'll explain why uh, the, the, this account fails. And uh, section six, that's the last section, will uh, convey my two uh, proposals on, uh, on the issue. Okay, so um, first, what the question of a Kantian artist, artistic sublime is. So before any discussion of the possibility of a Kantian artistic sublime, it is crucial to clarify the notion of the sublime that is relevant to our aesthetic theoretical purposes here. The analytic of the sublime in the critique is concerned with how certain natural objects and phenomena can elicit an aesthetic experience and or judgment of the sublime. And this is distinct from the question of what things are to be appropriately called sublime. The latter is what Kant seems to care more about in his pre-critical essay, Observations on the Feeling of the Beautiful and the Sublime, though with a view to offering more of an empirical inventory of what particulars are sublime, as opposed to beautiful, ugly, or ridiculous. These are uh, aesthetic predicates, and less of a theoretical analysis of the predicate uh, sublime or the experience of the sublime. The observations offers a very long and diverse list of sublime things. Uh, this is a funny uh, list actually. So some uh, of them are natural objects and the list includes some artworks and artifacts, but also moral virtues like friendship and truthfulness as well as vices like uh, moral failings like wrath and brown and black eyes, uh, older age, the night as opposed to the day, a long duration, uh, understanding and boldness, male sex, white race, all sorts of things. Uh, so offering such an inventory of sublime things does not at all fit with Kant's theoretical ambitions in the critique even though one can find remnants of the observations in the critique, where Kant still occasionally uses the term sublime in a loose manner as a predicate of things, um, including artworks. So this leads some to the hasty conclusion that Kant's position in the critique allows artistic sublimity. However, in light of the clarification above, uh, Kant's calling an object sublime does not warrant uh, or justify that, that or, 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 or necessitate that he holds that that object can elicit the experience of the sublime, the phenomenology of which he lays out in the analytic. And it is the latter that I'm concerned with when I raise the question of the possibility of a Kantian artistic sublime. So the question is, can an artwork elicit the experience of the sublime as it is described in the analytic? Now, not only does the critique not offer a theory of how art can elicit the experience of the sublime, even say in its detailed discussion of art, but it also does at times quite explicitly exclude the possibility of art evoking pure and aesthetic judgments of sublimity. Now in a somewhat perplexing move, right after citing uh, Egypt, Egyptian pyramids and St. Peter's in Rome as examples of objects occasioning the feeling of sublimity in their viewers, Kant seems to radically qualify the theoretical significance of his own examples. So this is uh, uh, the quote on, uh, in section one, if the aesthetic judgment uh, is to be pure, that is not mixed off uh, with anything te teleological as judgments of reason. And if an example of that is uh, to be given, which is fully appropriate for the critique of the aesthetic power of judgment, then the sublime must not be shown in products of art. So that's the quote. Of course, one could argue along with, for instance, um, uh, Wicks and Clevis and, and, and Geyer that impure or adherent uh, sublimity also constitutes a genuine case of sublimity. And that Kant's remark about the impurity of artistic sublimity is not really surprising given that he holds that artistic sublimity is impure and yet genuine beauty. However, Kant's remark here points not only to the unavoidable impurity, impurity of any possible artistic sublime, but also raises doubt as to the um, aesthetic relevance of any possible judgment of sublimity that would be evoked by artworks or human artifacts in general. 
Uh, so this is a very important point, the, the, the point about the aesthetic relevance of uh, uh, these uh, judgments or experiences uh, uh, triggered by artworks. Um, and I will revisit uh, this, this later on. Now, at any rate, the difficulty with the notion of a Kantian artistic sublime is not just a matter of an architectonic gap or lack of an explicit presentation in the critique. In fact, Kant's aesthetic theory presents the notion with significant philosophical problems that seem to make it inherently difficult to pursue. Now, I'm, I will talk about these problems. They're listed uh, uh, in section two on the handout. Um, so I'll start with the first problem that is about the phenomenology of the sublime. The analytic of the sublime presents a very specific phenomenology of the experience of the sublime, wherein the magnitude or power of an object and a natural object as it is uh, described uh, in the analytic exceeds the imagination perceptual imaginations perceptual limits of comprehension of the object in one unified representation and this failure of the imagination negatively makes with it the demand of reason for unity the unconditioned and infinity and thus the existence of a human faculty that can actually entertain such ideas that cannot be instantiated or presented by anything in sensible nature. This results in a sort of revelation or self-realization of the subject's rational, cognitive, and practical freedom from nature. This whole experience is felt by the subject as a movement between displeasure and pleasure, intimidation and relief, a vibration between negative and positive emotive states. The question here is whether an artwork can set this kind of phenomenology in motion. Based on Kant's note that the sublime is found in the formlessness or limitlessness of natural objects, as opposed to the beauty that is found uh, in the form of an object, some like Emily Brady uh, suggest that art cannot elicit the sublime because artworks have ultimately definite forms and limits in space and time. However, I think that formlessness should not be understood literally here as all objects of nature are informed and limited too. Kant's point is rather that the object that stretches the imagination of the subject beyond its maximum capacity of comprehension occasions the feeling of a lack of a unified form and limit. So the formlessness is uh, the, the, the cognitive result in the subject, not, uh, not literally in the object. So the more appropriate worry, I think, with regard to the possibility of artworks stretching the imagination uh, beyond its limits of comprehension must concern the magnitude or scale uh, uh, and power, even if artworks could represent the kind of magnitude and power that we find in nature, uh, like think of mountains, oceans, storms, uh, and, and then these are requisite for the phenomenology of the sublime, they would lack those physical attributes themselves. So that's the first problem, the phenomenology of the sublime. It's too specific, uh, too tied to nature. Um, the second problem, so, the disorder, I think, is, is from uh, uh, the less serious to the more uh, serious problem. So I'm, uh, I'm raising my hand here now. Nature as the indispensable component of the sublime is the second problem, I think. What is revealed by every instance of the sublime experience is human freedom from the magnitude. And I, I take this to be transcendental freedom. We can talk about this. Freedom from the magnitude or power of outer sensible nature. Moreover, the same contrast is also reflected at the level of mental faculties between reason and the imagination, uh, which Kant calls the sensible nature in us. It is worth underscoring here that the cognition or awareness of one's own freedom, whether it is theoretical, cognitive, or moral practical, is an important philosophical problem for Kant. Here, Kant's account of the sublime offers an intimate way in which we feel our freedom, our own freedom, both cognitive and practical. Uh, I, I keep saying cognitive and practical because cognitive corresponds to mathematical sublime, practical corresponds to uh, dynamical sublime. That nature should elicit this feeling is particularly meaningful as Kant understands freedom as freedom from natural causal determination and limitation. All of this makes nature not only the appropriate context for the occasioning of this experience of the sublime, but also the indispensable structure, structural component of this very experience itself. 
So uh, nature is, as it were, built into the notion of the Kantian sublime. So both Robert Clewis and, and Thomas More argue against this, uh, uh, this thesis, that, that indispensability of nature for the sublime, based on Kant's account of uh, subreption, and claim that what is truly sublime is not any object of nature that might elicit the experience of the sublime, but human reason or an idea of reason. Well, there's some truth to this, but what they do not seem to recognize uh, is that the sublimity of human reason is in fact defined in contradistinction with the limitedness of sensible nature inside and outside us. There's a broader approach that tends to dismiss both the specific phenomenology of the sublime and the indispensable role of nature by emphasizing the end product of the sublime experience, that is the revelation of human freedom and or the rational uh, transcendental supersensible aspect of humanity. Accordingly, any experience that involves or leads to such revelation or presentation would be called sublime and that such revelation is not tied to a specific phenomenology or a specific context of objects. This approach obviously opens up conceptual space for artistic sublimity, but it does so at the cost of trivializing the content of the Kantian sublime in which a specific phenomenology necessarily connects with, the sens with sensible nature outside or inside us. It is, however, precisely this phenomenology that makes the experience in question aesthetically relevant, at least insofar as Kant's aesthetic theory goes. While other objects might lead to such revelations or to feelings of awe or, or wonder, Kant would recognize sensible nature as the only sort of thing capable of producing the phenomenology of the sublime. Okay, so the third problem is about uh, the uh, Kant's conception of art. Um, actually, third and fourth problem. So here's the, here the architecture, here's the first two problems are, are about his notion of the sublime. The, the third and fourth are about his notion of art. Now, according to Kant, art is a purposive activity aiming at pleasing the viewer. Uh, and as noted earlier, this would make artistic sublime at best impure or adherent. While impure sublime can still be genuine, the problem here is how art, if its purpose is to please, can be contrapurposive and displeasing, which is a requisite for the elicitation of the Kantian sublime. Another related worry here is that art as the embodiment and expression of the artist's intentions and freedom could not serve the revelation of the viewer's own freedom, which is always a self-reflexive and first-person cognition for Kant. Rachel Zuckert, uh, I think rightly points out that the revelation in the sublime is not that of a fact, that is that we have a reason or that we are transcendentally free, but a first personal sense of what it is to inhabit reason and be a free agent. So the, the last one uh, is um, about art being a beautiful representation. Kant asserts that art displays this quote, art displays it's excellent precisely by describing beautifully things that in nature would be ugly or displeasing, uh, end of quote. So even if art represents sublime themes or content, that is objects that would naturally elicit the sublime without the mediation of art, it must have a beautiful form. This introduces a clear distinction between the representation of the sublime and the elicitation of the sublime. That is to say, the latter does not necessarily follow from the former. The worry here is not that the artistic sublime would have to be a mixture of beauty and sublimity, uh, something Kant calls splendid or magnificent in the observations, but that our aesthetic response to artistic representation, even of the sublime content, would be to the form or manner of that representation and thus yield judgments of taste or beauty and not of sublimity. And I admit that Kant's theory of aesthetic ideas complicates this a little bit by suggesting that our response to representational art should, take, uh, should also take its content into account, but I will uh, return to this point below. Now, uh, what options do we have uh, given these problems? Um, first of all, uh, one can argue that art cannot elicit the sublime of any kind, and it makes sense that Kant does not offer any serious consideration let alone a full-blown th theory of artistic sublime. Uh, this is uh, kind of what I argued for 
about 15 years ago. Um, second, art can elicit the same kind of sublime as nature, but perhaps not as purely, though as genuinely as nature. Maybe this is uh, Robert's position. Uh, um, he can uh, explain himself. Uh, in this case, Kant would be guilty of neglecting an, imp an important avenue of aesthetic experience in his major treatise on aesthetics. So I find this narrative uh, a bit implausible given Kant's architectonic obsessions and needs to be, and this uh, narrative I think needs to be complemented by a list of solutions to the problems uh, above. The third option is, uh, so the third and fourth, fourth options are more optimistic. Uh, art cannot elicit the kind of sublime laid out in the analytic, but perhaps a sublime of a different kind. The question is whether our judgment on this different kind of sublime would be a genuinely aesthetic one, say in the Kantian sense. What we have at hand is the fact that Kant does not offer a theory of a kind of sublime elic elicitable by art. This means that he either does not at all consider this kind of sublime or does not find it worth theorizing as opposed to, for instance, uh, artistic beauty. It is then quite possible that Kant does not think that the judgment on this alleged hypothetical artistic sublime would be aesthetic and relevant to his project in the critique. Uh, Emily Brady, uh, uh, for instance, claimed that only the original sense of the sublime, the kind elicited by nature is aesthetically relevant. And the last option is, um, the following, since a set of constraints on the possibility of a Kantian artistic sublimity is rooted in Kant's fairly restrictive old fashioned conception of art, one strategy to sidestep these uh, constraints would be to resort to a non Kantian, postmodern, contemporary, or avant garde conception of art, which would allow the artist to displace this discomfort and even disgust the viewer, and, and thus could, in principle, elicit the Kantian sublime. Leotard, for instance, uh, argued along these lines when he claimed that some contemporary artworks can elicit the Kantian sublime by presenting the unpresentable. And more recently, uh, uh, Kuplin and uh, uh, Wanda Nabile have suggested uh, that the Kantian sublime or some modified version of it could find a more suitable home in contemporary art. Okay, so uh, one and two are not really satisfactory options, right? Um, while three and four may be valuable approaches from the viewpoint of theories of aesthetics and art in general, they do not live up to the real challenge here, but evaded by modifying either the notion of the sublime and that of art in question. The real challenge for those who defend the possibility of a Kantian artistic sublime is to offer a positive account, uh, which is based on, or at least compatible with Kant's text and can address the problems that have been pointed out above. And one attempt at such an account that gained a lot of traction in the literature uh, was defended by Kirk Pillow and Robert uh, Wicks in the uh, mid 90s. Um, so this, this uh, account finds room for artistic sublimity in Kant's theory of aesthetic ideas. Aesthetic ideas are imaginative presentations of artistic genius. They occasion boundless content of thought express what is not expressible through determinate concepts and present the supersensible through various compositions of sensible elements like imagery, colors, and sound, etc. This presentation of the supersensible is the essence of the Kantian sublime. Accordingly, the argument goes, one and the same artwork that is the product of artistic genius elicits the experience of beauty and the experience of sublimity at once. Our response to this form yields a judgment of taste our response to this representational content, that is aesthetic ideas, yields a judgment of the sublime. Pillow puts it quite uh, succinctly, uh, quote, within one and the same artifact, the aesthetic idea possesses a sublime interior content recommended to us uh, by its outwardly beautiful form. For this reason, the work of fine art, which exhibits demands for its judgment, two distinct modes of aesthetic reflection. Both beauty and sublime inhabit the work of art, end of, end of quote. So I list some problems with this positive account. Uh, I'm, I, will, I, I have to speed up a little bit. Uh, so uh, the first problem is that uh, it leads to what I take to be a, an extremely implausible consequence that all beautiful art is sublime. 
uh, I put down the, the argument and the logical uh, uh, entailment relations there. Uh, if, you, if you look at uh, this, uh, section five, uh, uh, the, first for, uh, the first part of section, section five. So one, two, three are uh, Kant's own assertions. And number four uh, is uh, the idea that all beautiful art employs aesthetic ideas. And if you plug in Pillow Wick's thesis, that art elicits sublime through aesthetic ideas, the conclusion follows that, that all art elicits a sublime. Um, so this uh, I think find, uh, I find very implausible, uh, but perhaps in order to avoid this conclusion, Wix qualifies his thesis as that only the best or greatest works of art can elicit beauty and sublime at once, though without explaining why the elicitation of beauty and sublimity at once would amount to better art or why better art has to be better at eliciting both sublime and sublimity at once. Wanda Nabili, on the other hand, seems to recognize the inevit inevitability of this conclusion, but also admits that this is no longer a Kantian sublime. Uh, quote, he says, uh, unlike Kant, I no longer define the sublime as a feeling that is transcendentally distinct from the beautiful, but as an aesthetic category that refers to an excess that is perhaps always somehow inarticulately present in the feeling of beauty, end of quote. Now, the second issue with this account is that one motivation for this account is that a judgment of taste is about the form. Yet this is not entirely true in the case of art, even though Kant says that the beauty of art consists in its form, uh, his theory of aesthetic ideas suggests that the judgment of taste on art is about form, content, and the relation between the two. Now, I listed uh, two other problems. Uh, you can look at the handout. I'm going to skip them. Uh, one is about uh, the, the, uh, um, the experience itself. Uh, uh, the other is about um, uh, the phenomenology. But I want to move on to my own uh, suggestion here. Uh, so uh, I have two modest uh, proposals. Uh, uh, they, uh, they point to the possibility of artistic sublime, but with, with some constraining conditions. So if I suggest, if, Kant is, if art is to elicit the Kantian sublime, its form would be a better candidate than its content. This requires a particular mental condition on the part of the viewer. Um, the viewer must perceive the artwork as sheer magnitude or power by abstracting at least temporarily from the fact that it is a human artifact from what its purpose may be, uh, what it is supposed to represent or signify. Only then can the art, uh, uh, art artifact elicit the experience of the sublime in the way nature itself can do. I call this the abstraction thesis. And there's textual basis for the abstraction thesis. This kind of abstraction is precisely what Kant seems to have in mind when he describes the experience of the spectator gazing at the Egyptian pyramids from a certain vintage point. Or when first entering, he says, first entering uh, St. Peter's uh, in Rome as exemplifying the experience of the natural and not artistic sublime. Um, that, that I find very significant. The reference to the pyramids and the uh, Sistine, uh, Saint, Saint Peter's uh, is in the context of his description of natural sublimity. So the spectator is captivated and bewildered by these objects qua mere objects of perception, independent of and prior to any possible further reflections on what kinds of things they are. This does not exclude any subsequent aesthetic response to their beauty, but the experience of the sublime elicited by artworks requires a tempor temporary and perhaps involuntary suspens suspension of any judgments of taste. So uh, I believe that if my proposal or proposition regarding the uh, possibility of temporary abstraction or bracketing of taste in our response to an artwork is psychologically feasible, it can successfully address the most pressing conceptual problems for a Kantian artistic sublime, such as art as necessarily beautiful or art as having the purpose of pleasing. One important caveat here is that one, one, one might rightfully ask whether we would really be responding to the artwork as an uh, as an artwork in a state of abstra abstraction from its objective status as an artwork. Uh, the worry is that if we could indeed achieve such abstraction and perhaps the artwork, let's say a mere magnitude, then we would not be engaging with it qua an artwork anymore. Um, I can say two things about it. Um, 
first um, Kant's statement is explicitly and specifically about the beauty of art and the judgment of taste in response to it. Um, second, while Kant seems to hold that aesthetic response to an artwork is preceded by a logical determining judgment that it is an artwork, um, and this could be facilitated if not warranted by the physical setting of presentation, he clearly does not think that this logical judgment or cognitive awareness should be the basis of the aesthetic response. Okay, um, I, 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 I will wrap up this and show you some examples, uh, what I take to be examples. Can you go back? <laughs> yeah, I think this kind of effect is more likely to be caused by large scale uh, objects. So architecture is, I think, a better candidate. Uh, okay, so the pyramids, this is a Kant's own example. Uh, he talks about uh, the weaver uh, being captivated and losing their sense of uh, uh, self, you know, uh, when they look at the pyramids from a certain vintage point. Uh, and this is St. Peter's um, in Rome. Uh, these are two examples that Kant cites as uh, uh, sublime elicited by human artifacts. Uh, <clears throat> my favorite example is Hagia Sophia in Istanbul. Uh, this is the, the volume is so gigantic. Uh, uh, you, you, your, your judgment really uh, gets suspended uh, uh, or, or choked by, by the sheer volume of the object, the artifact. You don't even raise the question of what it is. You know, uh, you lose your sense of space. Actually, uh, it's it's just uh, indescribably large. This volume. Um, so Grand Central gave me a similar. Uh, feeling too when I first entered into it. Um, yeah, it's just sheer volume really uh, crushes you. Um, so I think Richard Sellers, the, the, the controversial sculpture, uh, tried to attain that kind of <clears throat> uh, impact on the viewer. Uh, so this is called Inside Out. Uh, this is Tilted Art, very controversial piece. Uh, people were so offended that um, uh, the judge ruled uh, it to be removed from uh, a, 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 a square in New York in 89. <clears throat> People also argued that it disrupted their, uh, uh, <clears throat> disrupted their, 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 their square. So this is Simitson's, uh the spinal jelly, uh, earth art or land art. This also, uh, I think, uh, would uh, might create that kind of effect on the subject. Okay, so this was the first proposal. I'll quickly talk about my second proposal, which is uh, um, smaller. Uh, so while Kant seems to hold that an aesthetic response to an artwork is preceded by, so, sorry, I'm reading from the, okay. So of course, uh, earth art or architecture more likely to create this uh, abstraction effect, but there's one, possibility that is worth considering with respect to representat representative visual arts like painting here. As opposed to Pillow's claim that uh, sublime representation of art is not constrained by sublime themes, I hold that if art is to elicit the content sublime to its content, it must depict sublime themes. So this restriction on the content blocks the problematic conclusion that every beautiful artwork is sublime, which as we saw earlier, <clears throat> the Wix pillow thesis cannot avoid. However, as many have rightly noted, sublime representational content is not a sufficient condition of eliciting the sublime experience. Now, I propose that if art is to elicit the content sublime through its content, it is more likely that it can do so in a second order manner. Through representing not sublime content itself, but the sublime experience of another subject. And I call this the indirect representation thesis. And this is what romantic painters of the sublime, like Caspar David Friedrich and uh, Johann Christian Dahl, seem to have tried to achieve when they have portrayed human beings' encounters with the sublimity of nature. So these are my uh, other examples. So this is the famous wonder of the sea or fog. We uh, we see the the figure uh, from behind. Uh, so mon by the sea. Similar uh, uh, setting, uh, uh, we don't uh, get to see the view that much, but 
uh, we are located behind the subject. Here's another one, woman before the rising sun. Uh, again, we are located uh, behind the subject and, and try to imagine what they might be seeing or not what they might be feeling. Another one over here. And there are so many, I just take a few. Uh, this can't be a coincidence that they, they keep doing this. Uh, mm -hmm. And this is uh, another one. Um, so this is from a Norwegian romantic, uh, Johan Christian Dahl. Again, there are two men here. You can see from behind and uh, the eruption of Vesuv. Uh, so again, you see people looking at the uh, eruption and you see, you see them from behind. Uh, okay, so, so what happens here is um, these paintings can be said to represent first order sublime themes or first the viewer still sees the sublime natural landscape. Second, the viewer is directly shown the human uh, nature encounter. However, the setting is also configured to represent what might be called the second order sublime. We as weavers are located behind a subject or multiple subjects, gazing at a scene that would elicit the sublime experience in us if we were in their place. So we are invited to have the perceptual empathy or identification with the depicted subjects and to imaginatively reconstruct uh, what they would be perceiving and how they would be responding to it. So, what is the advantage of this? I'll just uh, quickly say this and, and uh, conclude. There's an important advantage of this kind of second order uh, representation of the sublime over the first order representation of the sublime in terms of the possibility of eliciting the content sublime. The former gives more freedom to the viewer as the subject of the aesthetic experience. As I noted uh, earlier, the real worry regarding the purposiveness of art is not that it makes any possible artistic sublimity impure, but that art as the expression of the artist's intention and freedom might not serve the revelation of the viewer's own freedom. The kind of imaginative reconstruction that is evoked by paintings that offer a second order representation of the sublime is relatively free from the painter's instructions. With the use of the real rear image of the subjects in the painting, we are trans transferred or plucked, as it were, into the scene and encouraged to imagine the real perceptual effect that the sublime scene, scene would have upon us. In a way, the two-dimensional, specially limited artistic medium removes itself and leaves the viewer as confronting the sublimity of nature. Thank you. Some time for questions. Thank you so much for the talk. I'm Mavis Biss. Um, it seemed one, one thought that I had from the beginning of your talk is that it's not curious that Kant didn't have an account of the sublime in response to art, if you think art historically. Mm -hmm. All the examples come after 800, <laughs> um, I mean 1800. Mm -hmm. And so I don't think it's, I don't find it curious that the, the theme of the sublime was ushered in partly by Kant's influence, I think, mm -hmm. um, in, in our work. Um, in response to your um, first proposal about the abstraction thesis, I, um, um, I'll put, explain my response and then I might, you, you can tell me if I'm getting you wrong. Um, the thought that I had is that if you want to say that if art is to elic elicits uh, the sublime through its form and its magnitude, I, I worry that this is not art, the artwork's not eliciting the sublime yes. as an artwork. Yeah. Because what I mean, depends on your theory of art, how you're going to cash this out. But yeah. I'm, I'm quite, um, you know, attracted to Richard Eldridge's uh, mm -hmm. view that it's the, it's a, it's this particular, uh, the, the idea that it's the fittingness of work to content that's special about mm -hmm. artwork. And I mean, the, the artworks that you showed to talk about before, the, the works of mo um, modernist sculpture, that in, mo in modernism, the content is related to the, I mean, what you're doing with the formal material is for the content. So I think there, I'd like to hear more about that form content issue. Mm -hmm. um, so thanks so much. Yeah, um, thanks. Uh, I thought you were getting at something else that I was more worried about <laughs> when you when you say uh, uh, when um, art elicits the sublime uh, uh, true form 
but maybe it's not art anymore. No, no, it's just the it's not doing so it that's not art. 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 It's doing it claw yeah. big thing. Yes, that uh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, yeah, I I don't think the art content distinction uh, uh, is has to be that uh, you know strict here. Uh, but we are responding to uh, when we are responding to the sheer magnitude or power of an object. Uh, we suspend our judgment of what it is supposed to represent. So you start by the by the large object, and you feel intimidated by the physical, you know, mm -hmm. sheer size of it. Uh, you don't, at least temporarily, you don't raise the question of what it is supposed to represent. So you don't engage with the content representation of content, or I mean. Well, there is no representation. You can have content that's not representation. Why? Well, you, why what is, is what, what is the content of uh, like a large like requirements? So I think okay. So I'm gonna let I'm gonna let other people ask questions, but I think you can't avoid issue of of what art becomes art historically issue full, fuller. Mm -hmm. Okay. In your in terms of options, you can't avoid thinking about the shifts in how, what has happened or historic. Mm -hmm. So it's you're more sympathetic to those accounts of uh, uh, continuous mm -hmm. survival and contemporary art. I think there's multiple, mm -hmm. I think multiple things can be true, but you can't handle the contemporary art without thinking about the art historical transformations that have occurred since Kant's time. Right. <laughs> I don't think I'm close to that. <laughs> yeah. okay. So just time for one question more. Okay, um, thanks so much. Great talk, uh, learned a lot. I don't know a lot about this. So I'm just curious, how do you look at, because obviously most of your examples are visual, which we're talking about, mm -hmm. the right idea. But I wonder how you think about um, like verbal examples of science. It seems like there might be some, right? Like Kant mm -hmm. makes his reference, even if there are still to the inscription of the Temple of Isis, right? The most sublime words that are said. Um, in the uh, essence of beautiful and sublime, he talks about Milton's representation of hell, yeah. and there is this like center beautiful book which kind of argues that there's these Miltonian themes woven all the way throughout all of Kant's works, where he does seem to look at Milton as you know, if anything's going to be sublime in the written word, that it would probably be Milton. Um, do you think? Yeah. How how do you should this your hand? Yeah. Also, those things don't necessarily relate to nature in the same way. Like they both represent something that's not natural. I don't know if that's a problem for you. Um, but if you think of the sublime still relation nature in some way, that might be tricky thing. Yeah, I mean, there are multiple th things to be said about that. Uh, Paul Geyer uh, uh, wrote a paper on uh, on exactly uh, uh, poetic uh, sublimity. Uh, um, and he thinks, well, as Kant says, if, if anything, a, a, any uh, human uh, object, human art, uh, is to elicit a sublime, uh, poetry is the closest thing to it. I'm a bit skeptical, <laughs> skeptical about that. Uh, I, I, I take that reference to the, the you know the inscription from the uh, Temple of Isis uh, as as an example of what remains uh, from the observations. You know, it just uh, it just attributes sublimity to objects in a non-technical sense sometimes, and that's one of one of the examples uh, because it lacks that. Uh, Pedagogy. It seems like technology is something so so much greater than ourselves, right? Like I'm all that is all that ever will be. My veil, no one has removed. But that seems like it does evoke both a sort of cosmic sense of horror and also a sense of greatness beyond what I can envision or imagine. Right. I mean, again, what I'm trying to say that not everything that can evoke those feelings is aesthetic supply. So things can elicit the feelings of sublime, or you know, feelings of greatness, or you know, trigger uh, those rational ideas, uh, you know, uh, uh, makes them vivid or enlivens them. Uh, that, that doesn't necessarily mean that the experience that we are having is that it's, it's the aesthetic experience of the sublime. So that's that's that kind of uh, caveat I'm, I'm pushing for. Right? Now, an object can be sublime. But that's not necessarily uh, a presentation of the uh, aesthetically relevant uh, experience of the supply. Okay. okay, so thank you very much. Yeah, thank you.
So 25, then 15, yes, right. that's okay, so. Or, or as you wish, I mean, you can also do more right. than 10. Yeah. Yes, right, but ballpark, just so I can. Can I give you? You don't have presentation, nope, right? Nope, I do okay. not. Just me. Yeah. They have to it's, listen to me good. and look at me. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. I am. How are you? <laughs> okay. So it's my pleasure to introduce you Christy Sweet from Texas A&M University. Her talk will be speaking freely, taste, census communis, and political progress. Hi, thank you all for being here today. Um, I'm really excited to uh, talk about free speech in Kant. It's a project I've been um, pondering for a long time and I'm just now getting around to. Um, so I'm interested to hear your thoughts and responses to it. Um, I'm gonna just do a little bit of setup at the beginning. This is actually like a 33 page paper. So I've extracted just a little bit out of it. Uh, so I'm going to make some claims that I'm hoping you'll just grant me along the way <laughs> before I kind of get to the meat of the of the paper. So the question that I'm really interested in con um, kind of perennially is about reasons efficaciousness in the natural order, right? This is a central problem of Kant's critical project. How is it that reason and the freedom of the human will can enter into the natural order, right? How does that happen? How is it the case that human beings through the exercise of their will can transform the world in which we live to be in accord with the demands of reason? It's a question I'm really interested in Kant. Um, practical philosophy, third critique. Um, so that's sort of the frame for the project. Free speech seems to me to be where the rubber meets the road for at least one answer to this question, how is it that reason can enter into the world in such a way that it transforms the natural order um, such that it can more closely approximate the rational world order that freedom demands. Okay, so freedom, so, so in this, uh, you know, in this context, free speech is the mechanism by which uh, we move ourselves closer to the ideal civic condition. So what I wanna talk about first, just very briefly, is uh, how laws, uh, the, the, the source of law for Kant, the, necess the, the necessity then of free speech in making good laws, the kind of discourse that he thinks has to ensue in order to uh, uh, bring that about. And then what I'm ultimately going to do is turn to the third critique as a way of answering the question, how then should we speak? So uh, I think it's less controversial to say free speech is a really important mechanism by which reason enters into the natural order and transforms the world around us. Um, but we that doesn't answer the question about how should we speak when we exercise our freedom of speech. And I think Kant actually has ideas about that, given what he says, not only about the purpose of free speech, but about how it is really meant to function. Uh, so then that, that'll be the bulk of the paper where I turn to uh, judgments of taste and kind of formal uh, structures of the judgment uh, of taste. And I say, and what I'll argue is that the modes of discourse requisite, uh, requisite to the concretization of uh, reason in the natural order are given in structures specific to judgments of taste, which uh, likewise um, aim at agreement without determinate objectivity. I'll talk about that just a little bit. So the structures that we find uh, recommended to us in the third critique for freedom of speech uh, are these. Uh, humility about the lack of objectivity of our judgments, confidence in eventual mutual agreement, recognition of the shared world to which we belong and a common way of being in this world. These are the structures that Kant outlines respectively for the self-relation involved in a judgment of taste, the relation we have with particular others in such judgments, and the broader universal human community that underlies all such communication to begin with. Okay, so very briefly, I just wanna talk a little bit about um, where laws come from. I'm just gonna focus on laws, right? We can talk about institutions, all these sorts of things that, that govern our lives. So Kant essentially says that the 
legislate, uh, a legislator makes the law, whether or not that's one person or a body. He typically talks about it as one person. And he says that the head of state, and here he's thinking of the legislator, must be authorized to judge for himself and himself alone whether laws pertain to the commonwealth's flourishing, which is required to secure its strength and stability both internally and against external enemies not in order, as it were, to make the people happy against its will, but only to make it exist as a commonwealth. Now, the legislator can indeed err in his appraisal of whether those measures are adopted prudently, but not when he asks himself whether the law also harmonizes with the principle of right. For there, he has that idea of the original contract at hand as an infallible standard. For, provided it is not self-contradictory, that an entire people should agree to the law, however bitter they may find it, the law is in conformity with right. So what the job of the legislator is, essentially, is to exercise good judgment. We see this uh, it, uh, most fully in on the common saying essay, right, the theory practice essay, um, where Kant, um, uh, that, that, that's sort of his fullest explanation of this. So in the context for the particular discussion of the legislator in that essay is about progress within a state, uh, but it's part of a broader analysis that he means to give about how it is that seemingly abstract ideals uh, or principles can be brought into being in reality. And the, he introduces this essay then by talking about the relation of theory to practice in different arenas of practical life. And then specifically, he argues that there must be what he calls a transition between theory here, a sum of practical rules, right? So think of the doctrine of right as a sum of practical rules and practice, a means by which we discern whether something is a case of a rule. So judgment is just what affects this transition between a uh, theory, a set of rules, right? Those given in the doctrine of right for talking about politics and uh, evaluating whether or not a specific law is a case of that rule, right? That is what judgment is meant to do. That is the job of the legislator. However, Kant then goes on to say that um, the, the legislator is only human and, is, and as such is subject to error in the exercise of their judgment about whether or not a specific law is a case of these practical rules given to us in the doctrine of right. So while the legislator can err, uh, so, so while they cannot err about the standard of the law, right, the rule, they, they have that. They can, however, um, uh, rather, the application of the principle to actual laws is going to be subject to the vicissitudes of human finitude. Kant argues that to assume that the head of state could never err or be ignorant of something would be to represent him as favored with divine inspiration and raised above humanity. End quote. Uh, it is precisely because of the human or because of the finitude of human judgment that Kant immediately follows with a prescription for free speech. He writes, quote, thus freedom of the pen is the sole palladium of the people's rights, end quote. It is a right to, quote, make publicly what seems to him to be a wrong against the commonwealth, end quote. So Kant will continue then the uh, uh, good chunk of that section to emphasize the need the legislator has for input in the um, for need for input uh, in terms of making a good judgment. So he argues that to deny freedom of speech is to withhold crucial knowledge the ruler needs to govern. Quote, uh, all knowledge of matters that he himself would change if he knew about them. And also that such knowledge is, quote, required for um, the legislator's own essential purpose. So the legislator, right, is supposed to exercise judgment about the relationship of the practical rules to whether or not uh, to, 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 they're supposed to apply that to the laws. Um, but they can err. So the they need good counsel <laughs> from the people. So free speech is meant to give good counsel to the legislator for, um, uh, for the exercise of good judgment. Now, here's a section where I'm just going to say some things and you're going to accept them for the sake of moving on. Uh, so Kant is really clear uh, throughout his corpus that this exercise of good judgment is a collective endeavor. So he does not think that like on my own, I'm just really gonna be able to have good judgment. He thinks that the proper exercise of thought is dialogical, it is collective, we need to be in conversation with other people in order to arrive at good judgment. He thinks the end point of that kind of deliberation is agreement. Now, this is an indeterminate agreement, right? There's no objective rule or proof we can give 
So, you know, when Mavis and I are deciding what's the best time to leave tomorrow morning to get to the, uh, you know, conference venue on the first day, right? We deliberate about it. We come to an agreement and the agreement is about, as Kant says, he says, the, the nature of the thing. It's not just that we have a shared opinion, a kind of contingent agreement. We, through our deliberation, arrive at really what the best thing to do is. So that's the kind of agreement he thinks is the endpoint of collective deliberation um, that will ultimately arrive at a good judgment. And he thinks that it is from that then that the people collectively can make a recommendation to the legislator about how to improve the laws. Okay, so that's the kind of context where I'm going to turn to now. The, the, then we have this question, how, so, so that's the purpose of the exercise of free speech how should we speak when we are engaged in that practice, in that public discourse about what the best thing to do is? So uh, sidebar, I'm really existentially motivated to investigate this question um, because at least where I live uh, in the US, uh, our exercise of free speech is piss poor to um, be frank about it, right? It is nothing but, um, ideology, um, posturing, right? There's no sort of genuine discourse. And we, when we talk about free speech culturally, we have this very libertarian notion that, that, simply, that free speech means I have a right to say whatever I want, which is in one respect true. But there's this deeper purpose that free speech has, which is meant to arrive collectively at a good judgment about what we should do not just express ourselves. So that recommends or ought to recommend a certain way of engaging in that speech to achieve that aim. And I think then that um, Kant in the third critique in these structures of judgments of taste gives us recommendations for how we ought to speak when we are engaged in public discourse. It's a pipe dream, I know, but <laughs> okay. So the, the wisdom or good judgment that we gain through public discourse is a progression in thought that Kant describes as an expansion or enlargement of our thinking. It is this growth, in fact, that Kant names the quote, original vocation of humanity, namely for us to enlarge our cognitions. That's in the Enlightenment essay, he says that. So progress in reason is an expansion of our thinking. That is the path to overcoming our prejudices and commitment to the current way things are. Kant uses the term to enlarge or to expand uh, if I turn to describe not only the development of our thinking over time, right? It talks about this sort of generationally in a number of places, but notably it is also the word he uses in the third critique to describe the broad-minded way of thinking we cultivate through the engagement with the arts. Specifically, this is sort of what happens when we uh, contemplate uh, aesthetic ideas in reflection on a work of art. And two, it is also the word he uses to describe synthetic a priori judgments in the first critique, right? So this word does a lot of work <laughs> in really important moments uh, in his corpus. But in all cases, something is added to our way of thinking in the expansion of our concepts. Crucially, that our goal in public speech is the enlarging or expanding of our thought suggests that public discourse ought to be transformative and not merely a debate that we must win. The transformative and, tra and transitional aims of public discourse help us frame the manner of speaking recommended by the third critique. So what justifies though turning to the third critique for this endeavor? Um, so, okay. I have a whole thing on Arendt and why this is different from Arendt and you know how she's kind of incorrect about some of this. We've got her own thing going on, but she does kind of get the main thing right. And James Clark puts it this way, that uh, the turn to the th third critique resonates because it holds out the possibility of agreement in the absence, even in the absence of objective criteria. Okay, so in one sense, this is exactly correct as I talk about earlier, but not here. Uh, so, but however, I think there are deeper systematic issues that recommend turning to the third critique, given Kant's own aims. These systematic concerns are the very ones, too, that underlie the possibility of agreement about an indeterminate matter. So Kant himself names judgment as that which allows for a transition between nature and freedom, right? This is how he opens the third critique. 
right? That famous passage about the incalculable gulf. He says we need a transition between freedom and nature, right? Freedom and nature never the twain shall meet, but we have this third independent sphere of judgment. That's what the third critique treats. And he says that uh, what it does is it offers a transition between these uh, two other spheres. So he's really consistent about judgment as this transition between theory and practice, freedom and nature, reason and nature um, kind of throughout. So the transition then is between how things are, nature, and then how things ought to be. So in the theory and practice essay, uh, we see how judgment works to affect such a transition, right? So it's really kind of a concretization of what the third critique, I think, gives a transcendental account of. Uh, we must be willing to transform and enlarge our thinking in order to move beyond the way that things are. Either specific laws and institutions or our own established prejudices to move ourselves toward how things ought to be. So we can turn to judgments of taste, which are pure exercises in judgment itself to discern what features belong to judgment proper. Judgments of taste inv involve both the enlargement of our thinking as well as the possibility of agreement with others. That is, uh, it's about the exercise of good judgment. Okay, um, I'm gonna skip that part. So judgments of taste, Kant argues, have what he calls two peculiarities. On the one hand, we make claims about beauty as if they are objective. That is, he says, quote, with a claim to the assent of everyone else, end quote. On the other hand, and at the same time, we understand that our claim is, quote, not determinable by grounds of proof at all, just as if it were merely subjective, right? He thinks that when we engage with works of art, we, this, like, we understand this about the kinds of judgment we're making, that it seems true to us objectively the case, but also, you know, other people might not come along, even though we think they should. So when we claim that something is beautiful, we do so with this sense of conviction of our own rightness, but we also recognize that the sense has no ground outside of us and anything objective that we can appeal to in order to prove it to others. Indeed, when we claim that something is beautiful, we comport ourselves to our own judgment in two seemingly contradictory ways. On the one hand, we expect others will agree with us. On the other hand, we recognize there's a good chance that others aren't going to do so. So these two features open up the possibility for arguing, but also for coming to agree, right? So, so that but both of those possibilities are there for Kant uh, in judgments of taste. So in describing the antinomy of taste, Kant draws this distinction, quote, it is possible to argue about taste, but not to dispute, he says. To dispute is only feasible, he writes, quote, when there are determinate concepts as grounds of proofs. And so one assumes objective concepts of, as grounds of, judge, of the judgment, end quote. So in a dispute, one attempts to prove they are correct by way of the objective concepts employed. Since in these cases, there are no such concepts, we are permitted only to argue. Yet in arguing, he says, we still have, quote, hope of coming to mutual agreement. Hence, one must be able to count on grounds for the judgment that do not have merely private validity and are thus not merely subjective, end quote. So a dispute aims at proving one's rightness. Arguing, by contrast, aims at coming to mutual agreement about a matter, uh, which, as we saw, what I argue in a longer version, is what gives legitimacy to both the judgment made as well as to the appeal from the people to the government, right? So there's something in the structure of the judgment of taste that will yield uh, this, this kind of agreement without objective determinacy. So for Kant, proper political discourse share these peculiarities. While political speech is expressly about the rational measure of particular laws or practices, their rightness or wrongness is not given objectively or logically. I'm gonna say that again. The rightness or wrongness of laws or institutions is not given objectively or logically. Like this is the thing that I think we all think about ourselves and our judgment of political practices. We're really sure we're right and that we have the moral grounds for our claims. I just don't think Kant thinks, given what he says about the legislator, the need for good judgment, the indeterminacy of judgment in these matters, the application of reason to, to these matters. I just don't think he thinks it's objective in the way that you know we want to think it is. Okay. So moral ideas of political justice are just not objectively evident for Kant. So he's clear that the application of the practical rules of right, particular cases, uh, 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 two particular cases of law or practices are instances of judgment and that the legislator, 
and others, even ourselves, can err. <laughs> so this recommends that when we engage in speech in the public sphere, we do so explicitly embodying a cognizance of the kind of claim we are making, one that is not subject to objective determination. So political judgments like judgments of taste are not subject to a regime of truth or falsity. They are not given to disputes. We're making a claim that's inherently contestable in virtue of the possibility of errancy with no objective determination by which to adjudicate it. While at the same time, one for which we can hope of coming to mutual agreement. So that's the first recommendation that we enter into political discourse with that kind of you know, humility and cognizance of the kind of claim that we are making. Again, that's against the back, backdrop of, look, political discourse or free speech is supposed to be transformative, not just of other people, <laughs> but perhaps even of ourselves, right? Maybe I, I come to agree with Mavis that yes, we should you know, leave early. Okay, yes, I see that she's right, I am transformed. I think you can miss me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm giving you credit, Mavis. Um, okay, so, um, uh, so uh, let's, let's all right, I'm gonna skip that part. Okay, so it should be noted that none of this, actually, I'm gonna skip that. That's actually not all that. Uh, I have a section where, cause I'm sure this is gonna come up. No, uh, political judgments are not aesthetic judgments. <laughs> They're not, <laughs> they are not based on that. Don't worry, that's not the claim that we're gonna make here. Um, and you, you know, we can work that out out of, you know, how Hunt thinks about the idea of reason and the way that, you know, reason, um, because it's the unconditioned, can only have a mediated relationship to the world. Okay. Okay, so judgments of taste make an, uh, a further recommendation for political discourse, referring exclusively to the subject matter at issue. As there is no proof for adjudicating claims of whether a case is an instance of a practical rule, we may be tempted to appeal to our inner state especially given that we may often have experience of the law or practice at issue. However, as we find in a judgment of taste, the fact of one's feeling is not of itself evidence of anything, right? It's not evidentiary and it is not going to be uh, sort of a legitimate ground of argument. Well, I feel that it's beautiful. That's not, not an argument. <laughs> That's not really going to get you to agreement. So if the goal of communication is to arrive at a shared good judgment, referring to one's feeling will not bring this about. An interlocutor may describe a feeling ad infinitum, but this will not alter the other's judgment about the object in question. That is because while the feeling of pleasure is the ground of a judgment of taste, for example, uh, the judgment is in the end about the object. Reflection on the object, right, the representation of the object, is what gives rise to the pleasure in the first place. So only by engaging one's interlocutor about the object itself, right, the judgment, the application of the law to the case, is it, uh, a, is it possible for communication to yield agreement about something? So, uh, so they themselves may be led, uh, so then your interlocutor may be, um, in the case of art, be led to a free play of the faculties through this engagement. So even in this, they don't agree about the feeling but you're in agreement about the object itself. Likewise, with political discourse, one's personal subjective experience cannot be what makes its way into communication as evidentiary. It may serve as the ground of one's own judgment, but only in directing attention to the broader matter at hand from which the experience is derived can a conversation be had. What is public and therefore what is possible to agree about is the subject matter, whether a law or practice is the case of a practical rule. This is to say that like judgments of taste, communication and political discourse can only work if it remains focused on the object of consideration and is not about the private subjective experiences of the discussants. Only then may interlocutors come into agreement about a matter. We find further recommendations for successfully making judgments in the transitional sphere of politics in looking at the census communis. So I have a chapter in my book about the census communis. A lot of what I say here is sort of drawn on the conclusions that I come to there. So in the, uh, in the deduction of the judgments of taste, Kant asks, by what right can we make this weird judgment of taste? Uh, so what is it that undergirds the legitimacy of a claim made when there are no rules governing it and no objective measure by which it can be adjudicated? 
And it's it, his answer to this is the census communis. Um, so I'm not gonna make that argument. Uh, you, you know, that's, you know, elsewhere I've worked, I feel like I've worked that out. Uh, but I wanna draw our attention to what's significant about the census communis itself as what it is that legitimates judgments made without a determinate measure and then what it recommends for public discourse. So um, Kant writes, by census communis, uh, what must be understood is the idea of a communal sense, a faculty for judging that in its reflection takes account of everyone else's way of representing in thought in order as it were to hold its judgment up to human reason as a whole and thereby, and thereby avoid the illusion which from subjective private conditions that could easily be held to be objective would have a detrimental influence on the judgment. So the, the census communis is a sense we have that we are communal beings. Uh, that is our communal being is uh, further is found in a shared form of thinking, of representing things to ourselves and of reasoning. Kant associates the commonality of the conditions of thought with the possibility for communication at all. Carl Emmerich sums this up well. He says Kant probably holds the traditional theory that communication involves having the matching of subjective states. Uh, indeed, uh, you know, Kant sort of makes this argument um, elsewhere. What the census communis also gets at for Kant is uh, ultimately that human beings belong to the same world. <clears throat> that we do not you know, have our own sort of private truths, that we don't have our own worlds. There are not multiple worlds. There is one world to which we all belong. We all have these shared forms of thought. Yes, there are particular experiences, but that ultimately the fact, and Kant thinks this is a fact, I think, um, that we have the possibility for communicating with other human beings ultimately proves that we belong, to, that, that we have a shared way of being and that we belong to a shared world. And um, I think then further that what this recommends for entering into public discourse properly is that we have to acknowledge, we have to have the perspective or the starting point that we share a common world and that we are capable with communication. We are capable of communication with each other. So, uh, you know, the contrast to this would be this idea that my experience is such that, you know, you with your different experiences can never get at what I'm saying. I think Kant really thinks there has to be the capacity of publicness to, um, to the things we're saying if it's going to be effective. And I think uh, appropriating that expressly in our free speech is one of the further recommendations that we get from the third critique uh, in order to foster successful public discourse. Okay, I will stop there. <laughs> uh, thank you. Some time for questions. Uh, thanks. Um, so you said you need to accept this, but I don't know if there's people that make my you need us to accept. So, um, and that's, I guess, contrary to that of what dispute is a technical sense that there's no possibility of dispute in the technical sense of the And you would say that that, that should transfer to the disagreement. Rather in case of deciding whether a given factor is a case of right. um, it isn't uh, isn't there in the case of of, of politics um, aren't there objective bounds or and so then that and so right what we're, what we're debating is whether a particular practical rule is universalizable or whatever, right? It does thus respect the equal freedom of all. It's consistent with that. That is an objective. Well, we have the objective measure, which is given in the in the rules of the in the doctrine of right, and then he summarizes them again in the common or uh, in the theory practice essay. But and those are there. The question is whether or not specific laws or institutional practices are cases of that rule. Right, 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 right. But it seems like. There would then be a fact, the fact of the matter as to whether a given practical rule is a case of the rule or not. And power of judgment needs to come in order to you know, figure out whether or not it is. That's not easy and has a lot of training and all of that, right? But um, it seems that one can dispute, one can argue, well, 
but here, here are the features that a practical rule would have to meet for it to be a case of this. But does this particular practical rule have these features or not? And here, the, as we know, that the point can survive to put it on which features of the practical rule are we focusing on, what consequences might it have. Right. That sounds like what Kant says an argument is and not a dispute. I mean, uh, you know, there's not just going to no, be there's, one. There's, uh, sorry, there's a sorry. Field, two grounds of, of proof as opposed to in the aesthetic case where I, I, I can't argue you into it. I can't appeal to anything that you should find it beautiful because it has these features, right? In the fact, I can only appeal to like, look, maybe look at it from this vantage point. Maybe you'll have the same, mm -hmm. maybe the free play will have to be. Yeah, yeah, right. Whereas in the moral case, it seems to me, no, I can. Look, I can, I can give you the, the reason that Great. it doesn't have, you know, it's not universal for such a reason. Right? Yeah. So that, that seems to be a Great. Uh, and I totally agree with you about that, right? The, uh, the application of a rule to a case is not pure reflective judgment, right? So in the longer piece, I sort of cash that out, right? It, that, that is absolutely correct. But what is still kin is the indeterminacy. So you are correct, right? That what you are doing is appealing to the subjective measure in a way that you maybe are not when you are um, trying to, you know, interpret a work of art in such a way that you engage your interlocutor's imagination and understanding to come to the free play, you know, themselves. So you're, you're correct about that. I, I totally agree. And I think that's a really good, you know, uh, clarification to make, but there is still indeterminacy it, between it, there, the, um, the, the rule and the case, you know, the, you know, Kant's theory of history is such that, you know, he says, you know, reason requires practice. Like this is going to take time. It, you know, we have to test it out. We have to kind of keep doing it. And so, you know, I think there is a deep kind of, you know, optimism we have to have about agreement, about coming to a good judgment and a recognition of the fact that we are going probably in perpetuity to keep having to revise this. I mean, the, the, the broader systematic concern is about making reason concrete in reality. Reason is the unconditioned, it is universal, and it does not, that does not match up with, you know, reality, with the natural order. And so there's always going to be that gap for Kant. Like, you don't get that gap in your will because there, reason is the will. There, there, there is no no gap there, right? It can determine your will, can determine itself fully and completely. But reason just does not touch down in reality that way for Kant, which is why you need judgment to mediate it, which is why it's going to be piecemeal, I think, for him. Yeah, I guess I think that, that I agree that there's some sort of indeterminacy. I think it's in a different place, I guess, but I think it just comes from the fact that the case is always going to have more specific features. Yes, yeah, right, right, and okay. There, that's where the problem of how to subsume, you know, arises, mm -hmm. which features are specific cases matter. Maybe that exists even in theoretical, theoretical. Yeah, cases. sure. So I think, but anyway. Yeah. Okay. So perhaps we can just collect all the questions and Sorry. then you uh, answer to some of them now and some later, <laughs> because we don't have much time. So Martin? <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I'll probably get a chance to talk to you later, so I'll ask my uh, yeah. a bunch of questions. That sounds later. good. Okay. Yeah, so my, my question was first about the objectivity claim. Uh, you juxtapose reasoning things through uh, to uh, a claim of objectivity, and it seemed to me that in no case of objectivity do we have uh, anything more than that for Kant. Um, the other uh, question I had was uh, about uh, the common voice and your idea taken over from Karl Amerix that it's a matching of private uh, views. It seems to me, oh. uh, uh, so didn't uh, you uh, say that uh, he, he took the uh, view that your private view matches the other person private view? Uh, no, I think that just the general idea is that communication is possible because there's like it, that, that, you know, the matching up of the faculties with the way that things are in the world and that our communicating about it is just sort of evidence of that. I mean, it's sort of a general claim. So I'm really hesitant about the private view thing because I think Kant's whole point is that like you don't get private views in the public sphere. <laughs> the whole idea is to be sort of thoroughgoingly public and available in that way. Okay, but so that, that the possibility was really for my that. question. Oh. Uh, to what extent do you think that there is this uh, reasonable, 
uh, reasoning level, and then there is the subjective views, and then they come to match. Or no, okay. it's not. It's not just matching. Like, just if yeah. Mavis and I come with the same shared opinion about when to leave, that's not agreement. Agreement is reached at you know through deliberation and this you know quite likely transformation of what you had thought before, and it's because you are coming into agreement about the matter. Con you know the word that the phrase he uses in the Enlightenment essay is that you get insight. The collective, he says, gets insight into the nature of things. I mean, it's fast, you know. I like it. <laughs> I'm for it. Okay, so you, you. Thank you so much for this talk. I really enjoyed it. And I'm very sympathetic like, to the content you're presenting. One thing that I wanted to ask you is, you know, like uh, the engaging in the public discourse in this proper way. Uh, that you're depicting is like will eventually lead to, I suppose, like, to the enlargement of our thinking in general, like in the way that he's depicting in that Turkey. But one of the things about like, the enlargement of the, uh, when he talks about enlargement or expansion in the Turkey critique, Kant always talks about the expansion or enlargement of our, of our imagination. So I was like, thinking, like, I was wondering if also engaging the public discourse in this way, you know. Uh, deliberating in this way does it also has something to do with expanding our imagination yeah or are we imaginatively deprived and that's why we cannot communicate with right. each other so i'm just like wondering your ideas on that so uh i actually don't think he focuses that much on the imagination he talks about the enlargement of our concepts so i think it, you know the imagination part is the is a really Arendtian insight, right? And that's how she very much talks about it, is the expansion of the imagination, right, from these other subjective perspectives. And she's very interested in intersubjectivity as such. Kant is not interested in intersubjectivity as such. He's interested in, um, you know, the expansion of our thinking to come into accord with the way that things are in a more substantial way, is how I would put it. And, you know, so I think for him, you know, maybe it is an enlargement of our imagination, but what it really is is a, a sort of broadening of our capacities to um, to grasp things and make associations that are correct, even though they are not fully determinate. That's how I would would, would think about it. So, so I would be hesitant. I think that it's just an expansion of the imagination. Uh, I, I mean, partly because I hear the Arendtian thing. I don't know if that's where you're coming from. Or, or not, but you know that's sort of how that rings to me, and I think that's far too much about the subject for Kant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm thinking about um, like uh, I think I'm mostly fire thesis, but I'm thinking about the formula of the publicity of right in uh, the second half of perpetual peace, and that may give us grants to say certain positions are objectively wrong insofar as they don't mm -hmm. conform to the minimal standard of the formula of publicity. Of mm -hmm. I, I don't know if that's yeah. Like friendly to your thesis. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that you could say uh, that that measure of publicity is, is what has to stand. I mean, Kant just says, I mean, his point there is that the measure is of the publicness. Uh, and I don't think he's going to say you shouldn't say <laughs> those things. Um, we should want people to say those things so that we can offer a corrective. <laughs> like you do realize this thing you're forwarding is not in accord with the public good or, you know, with universality and hopefully, you know, kind of come to agreement about, uh, about that. I, I think that's perfectly consanguine with this standard of publicity that he has. Th th I would say, in fact, that's a way of thinking about proper public discourse for Kant. Last question. Thanks, uh, that was really interesting. Uh, but I wanted to ask about what happens to the idea of um, legislators seeking counsel from people. I, I got a little lost as how that ends yeah. up fitting with the project. It's not clear that the legislators participating in this process of transformative debate seeking agreement. I mean, right. there's a way of hearing what he's talking about that they're in practice as saying is like, sounds kind of naturally like a consultative hierarchy. Like the legislators yeah, yeah. trying That's to true. get things That's a great right, point. not sure how the effects are going to play out. So it sort of needs to get as much information as possible, freedom of the pen helps yeah, yeah. give the legislator all the information. But then, I mean, if everyone agrees about what's right, does the legislator have to do it? They, what, does no. the legislator have to act in accord with agreement? No, probably not. So like, what's the no. relationship? Yeah, so that's a great question. You know, I haven't worked all that out. Um, I do think the basic ideas of good counsel, um, you know, Kant doesn't say that the legislator has to listen, but, you know, he does seem to have the sense that 
it, you know, in saying that free speech is the palladium of, of people's uh, of the people's rights, he, that's his anti-Hobbesian moment pretty expressly, right? There's not the absolutism and that a government that is willing to listen uh, to the people is one that is not going to be absolutist in the Hobbesian sense. Um, but yeah, it, the way that he talks about it is of the people making a recommendation to the legislator. You know, we could develop, you know, a kind of Kantian inspired thing where the legislator takes part in it, right? So that they themselves are transformed. Like you could tell a story there. He doesn't. Thank you very much. Is Laura next? Oh, here? Laura. Laura, yes. <laughs> Sorry. No, no. <laughs> Sorry. I know, I know. It's hard with the floor. The floor can be a little straight. Do you have slides? I have a hand up. Okay, cool. So I'll get started. Um, yeah. is, is it okay with people? Uh, so I like to record it um, on a voice memo on my phone so that I don't have to kind of remember everything so fervently and later it's a little bit more easy to look back. Okay, great. There we go. All right. So um, the topic for my talk is Kant's theory of hope. And I have just at the start of the handout, which I think hopefully has gone around now, um, just what the main argument of the paper is. So just to lay it out right away really clearly. So I'm going to try to argue that at the end of Kant's life, at the end of his career, he changes two important and related aspects of his theory of hope. Um, so we see these changes in the essay, um, uh, an old question raised again, is the human race constantly progressing, which appeared in the conflict of the faculties. And um, so I'm going to argue that there are these two changes in his theory of hope that we see kind of work themselves out in that essay. Um, I'm also going to argue that those changes are for the better, that they result in an improved theory of hope. And just one thing to note to sort of get everything going, I'm just going to ask people to grant that the date of that essay is 1797. So obviously it appears in the conflict of the faculties, which comes out in, I think, 1798. The Cambridge edition, I know, lists the date of this essay in particular as 1795. There are people who have challenged that. I think they have good grounds for challenging it. I don't ultimately think a lot depends on it. And we can talk about that more in Q&A. But I'm just going to work with the assumption that the date of that essay is 1797 moving forward. All right. So given that, I'll just move into the first section where I talk about the first of the changes with respect to Kant's theory of hope that takes place. And what I'm going to focus on is the way that he switches from thinking about that which makes progress possible in terms of, or that which gives us confidence in progress in terms of a mechanism versus in terms of an event. So one thing that we all know from looking at that 1797 essay is he obviously talks about how, well, look, here's why we can have hope in human progress. It's because there's this event that has taken place this event being the esteem we feel in watching the French Revolution. And that's uh, the thing that gives us confidence that we're moving toward the better, right? And I think there's questions we can have about what's so special about 
bearing witness to the French Revolution in particular. We could talk a little bit about that. But the thing that's just really kind of um, striking or really kind of interesting is that he's talking about an event at all, right? Because if you look at his earlier writings on hope, what he seems to be looking to to explain why we should have confidence that things are moving to the better is not an event, but a mechanism. So just to give a couple of passages where he talks about that, he says, for instance, in Perpetual Peace, that nature guarantees perpetual peace through the mechanism of human inclinations itself. Again, another passage, nature comes to the aid of the general will, grounded in reason, revered but impotent in practice, and does so precisely through those self-seeking inclinations. So there's at least this kind of apparent shift, right? Where pre-1797, he's talking about a mechanism that seems to be working itself in human nature, and that's what's going to give us confidence that we're moving toward the better. Then in the uh, 1797 essay, it's an event. Now, I kind of recognize you might wonder, well, look, maybe this is just a shift in emphasis, right? Because prior to 1797, he did talk about things that we're going to do all along, right? It's not like he said that, oh, we have no contributions to make ourselves. It's all this mechanism. He obviously thought that there was going to be some contribution we would make. So maybe it's possible he's just said all he needed to say about this mechanism and now in 1797 is kind of moving on to this other thing, namely like our own contribution to progress. That's of course a possibility, but um, well, no, it's not. I think that's wrong. Um, and there's some really good reasons I think why we should think it's not just a shift in, shift in emphasis and that something important is actually kind of changing in his thought. And the reason for that is that if you look at that um, old question essay, there is some really, really interesting, uh, a really interesting set of passages where he seems to sort of almost really forthrightly criticize the idea that there could be a sort of mechanism that we could ever think as having this sort of instrumental role in positioning us for progress. And this you see when he's critiquing what he calls the eudaimonistic manner of representing human history, right? So if you know something about Kant's theory of history, he thinks, well, there's this kind of um, regressive view, right? We're all going to like be going worse and worse. He also plays with the kind of abdurist view ad advocated by Mendelssohn, which is, you know, the sort of Sisyphus picture, right? We just kind of cycle into stages where we're doing better and then doing worse again. Then, of course, he also thinks that there's a view where we're moving toward the better, and he likes that one. And what's sort of funny then about when you get to this 1797 essay, he seems initially to talk about that view where we're moving to the better, but he slaps on it a pejorative label calling it eudaimonistic. Right. And then you're like, why is he talking about this pejoratively? This seems to be the kind of thing he likes. And then if you start to read his comments further, you start to see, well, what he's criticizing, actually, in that kind of a certain version of progressivism, in that kind of eudaimonistic picture, he's criticizing the way that mechanism is thought to work in it. And here's what he says about this. He says, look, here's the problem with the kind of mechanistic or eudaimonistic view of improvement. He says, the effects cannot surpass the power of the efficient cause, thus the quantum of the good in the human being mixed with the evil cannot exceed a certain measure beyond which it would be able to work its way up and thus ever proceed toward the better. Eudaimonism with its sanguine hopes therefore appears to be untenable. And so he seems to be saying, look, you're never going to get on a kind of mechanistic vision of what progress looks like you're never gonna actually get anywhere because you can't get in the effects more goodness than was in the cause itself. And this seems to be the case, however you're thinking about progress, right? If you're thinking about it as the institution of the, the moral highest good, as the political highest good, even if you're just thinking, right, in terms of like, okay, can we get to a nation of devils? Like the recognition that we need a certain kind of social political order that you get even with that sort of nation of devils passage, that recognition is a real advance, right? There's a real transformation of understanding that comes when you have that sort of like almost modus vivendi that Rawls would talk about. And so regardless of how you're kind of cashing it out there, to think that a mechanistic sort of model would ever get you progress is, as he says, to engage in a sort of sanguine or unserious or just really kind of silly and not worked out form of hope. I think we see more criticisms of this kind of mechanistic model when he talks in some more detail about what's so interesting about bearing witness to the French Revolution. 
So he talks about the way that our sympathy for those engaging in that revolution is a kind of self-wrought expression of human freedom. And he talks about how it points to the capacity of the human race to be the cause of its own advance to the better. So it's something more like a teleological model of causation, right? Where something's both the cause and effect of itself. He says further that the event that foretells the better future would have to be considered not as the cause of history, right? I think he means in a mechanistic sense, but instead a kind of intimation or a sign. So there are these passages then where the mechanistic model seems criticized. And I would also just want to posit that I think he's right to criticize this, right? I think there are really good reasons to think that a mechanistic kind of vision of improvement would not actually ever get you anywhere and that it is a kind of sanguine view that it is unserious. So to build out this point, um, I'll first just direct us to the passage at the bottom of the first page. This is a passage from Perpetual Peace where he talks a little bit about how we sort of envision this mechanistic model of progress working out. And he says, it would only be a matter of a good organization of a state, which is certainly in the capacity of human beings or arranging those forces of nature in opposition to one another in such a way that one checks the destructive effect of the other or cancels it so that the result for reason turns out as if neither of them existed at all and the human being is constrained to become a good citizen, even if not a morally good human being. So that's his sort of like stab at how that mechanistic model would be thought to work. And, you know, just to be clear about what he's saying there and what he's not saying there, right? He's not saying there when he like sketches out that mechanistic model that human beings would have no role, right, in facilitating progress. He's not saying that he can like know with cognitive certainty that that's how it works. He's just saying like, look, here's how we can think it goes, right? Um, and another kind of passage from the theory and practice essay, he says, it's just simply not demonstratively impossible that there could be a sort of mechanism such that inclinations could be rendered harmonious with one another or put in this sort of just so arrangement, right? Whereas say for instance, my greed and um, Mavis's greed, instead of these becoming like two forces that work to make everything for the worse, we maybe sort of join up, it cancels each other out in such a way and we form a business and we make all the money together, right? <laughs> it's like that kind of model. So um, that seems to be the sort of thing he plays with in perpetual peace. But I think that that idea sounds just kind of awful and nuts. Um, and it definitely strikes me as too fanciful for a good theory of hope. And the reason why I say that, I'm kind of actually drawing inspiration for that from a different passage in Kant. Um, and so this will take just a second to set up. But there is a passage in Kant in the theory and practice essay where he talks about, you know, well, could it be possible that we'll get peace on the world stage, not by setting up a universal state, but by having a balance of power in Europe, right? Could that be possible that that would be the way forward for peace? And he says about that, look, here's why this balance of power idea would be untenable. He says, um, an enduring universal peace by means of the so-called balance of power in Europe is a mere fantasy like Swift's house that the builder has constructed in such perfect accord with all the laws of equilibrium that it collapses as soon as a sparrow is alighted upon it. So granted, that suggestion's worse, right? It's worse to put your faith in something fanciful when the stakes are as high as like war and death, right? And granted, Kant, in the kind of context of thinking about international relations, has to be thinking about action as opposed to what we can put our hope in, right? But nonetheless, this passage to me just points out how kind of laughable it would be to put your faith in a sort of like arrangement that is just so, right? That has to be just so perfectly constructed in order to move us forward. And if it's a kind of laughable idea in politics, I find it a laughable idea in the context of hope. And I also just don't see how it would be helpful to someone, right? Like if you're suffering from despair such that you don't see how a better future is possible, how is it going to help you to tell you to put your hope into something that seems even more improbable? Like, I just don't get how that's supposed to work. Now, I do kind of recognize as a response to that objection that someone might say, well, look, you know, Kant isn't requiring you to think this, right? He's just allowing you to think this. Um, he's not, you know, maybe suggesting or advocating anything at all. Maybe he's just saying like, look, 
that's how I find hope. I find hope in this idea of a mechanism of selfish inclination. And then maybe we might say, well, who are we to take away what conscious finding hope in? Um, but I really think that reply is very weak. Uh, so one, and I think the main reason why is just that I don't really think that Kant is um, in the kind of conceptual space where he's just like permitting us to think something. Sure, he's not requiring it. He's not saying you must find hope in this sort of idea of a mechanism of selfish inclination. But nonetheless, he's definitely doing something much stronger than merely permitting it, right? He's kind of setting a philosophical agenda. He's making salient for us certain avenues along which we could find hope. He's also, of course, telling us that personally, that's where he finds hope. And we would have thought that we were supposed to get guidance from where he finds hope, right? That we would sort of look to him as having some maybe good advice for us. And so given all of those kinds of concerns, I don't feel like it's just sort of like an innocuous option put forward. I think it's a, a suggestion that deserves real criticism and, and warrants such criticism. And I think it warrants even more criticism because there's just a better alternative available, right? Instead of putting, um, thinking about this mechanism of selfish inclination as that which is helping the human race uh, progress to the better, we could look to an event that we are actually experiencing, right? Um, and I also think that Kant wants a less speculative vision of hope in this final attempt to talk about hope. So to contrast a couple of passages in both Perpetual Peace and the Common Saying essay, he said, you know, we need an account of hope that would suffice merely for practical purposes. In this 1797 Old Question Raised Again essay, he says, we're searching for a proposition valid for the most rigorous theory in spite of all skeptics and not just a well-meaning or commendable proposition in a practical respect. So the less speculative, basically, the better as Kant comes to mature in his thinking of hope. All right, so that was the first kind of way his thinking changes, that he moves away from thinking about a mechanism and moves toward thinking about an event as that which gives us confidence in a better future. The second way his uh, theory changes kind of goes part and parcel with this, right? Because that mechanism of inclination was something that he would describe as being overseen by nature or providence. And so if his views about the mechanism changes, probably his views about how that oversight works change as well. And I think that's exactly what we'll also see. Um, so what I'll talk about in this section is how he kind of shifts the sort of emphasis of uh, who's sort of doing the work of giving us confidence from nature or providence to us and starts to give us a much, much more outsized role in comparison to that which of nature and providence plays, which then comparatively really shrinks up. So I'll note just to get this section going, a couple of tiny possible stumbling blocks. So one possible stumbling block is of course, it often seems like that Kant talks about nature and providence sort of interchangeably in his thinking about hope. And I'm gonna kind of do that as, as we go. I don't really think it's a problem for my view because my emphasis is not so much on like, what's nature doing, what's providence doing? It's about our role with respect to nature or providence. So, um, and we can talk more about that nature providence distinction, but just because the emphasis is on what our role is, I think it's okay to just keep going interchangeably. Um, another possible stumbling block that I just wanna highlight is that we do need to be a little bit careful too, because when we're doing this sort of contrast, right? Like looking at Kant's thinking after with 1797 and then before it, he's not entirely consistent in how he thinks about the roles of nature or providence prior to 1797, I think. So I think we can find um, at, at least these two kinds of models of uh, hope in nature and providence in those earlier pieces. So sometimes he has a kind of handoff model where he imagines us as having gotten guidance from nature or providence, and then the reins kind of get handed to us. So here's a passage from the conjectural uh, beginnings essay that seems to indicate that handoff model, where he says that the transition from the crudity of a merely animal creature into humanity, from the go-kart of instinct to the guidance of reason, into, in a word, from the guardianship of nature into the condition of freedom, you see there that kind of handoff, right? You're kind of leaving that go-kart. So sometimes he uses that kind of model. Other times though, he has a model that is kind of more like where the role of nature or providence is really ever present, right? Something you're sort of continually referring back to. 
Um, and so here's a couple passages where he has that. So from the idea essay, um, the human being wills discord, but nature knows better what is good for um, his species. It wills, uh, uh, sorry, the human being wills concord. Nature knows better, it wills discord. Um, that work of nature is described as sort of ever present and permanent and ongoing. In the perpetual piece, same thing. Um, what nature seems to be doing, not just what nature did, um, is provide the guarantee that what man ought to do in accordance with the laws of reason but does not do, it is assured he will do. So a couple of different sort of models seem at play there. The second model where the work of nature or providence seems ever present or ongoing, I kind of think of this as sort of echoing that like solid Kantian idea that look, in certain contexts, you rely on different standpoints from the perspective of moral action, right? You think about your own agency and you deliberate from that point of view, but when you're sort of like stepping back from a context of action and sort of looking at the world around you or trying to make sense of it, you think about nature or providence there, right? And you can sort of revert back to each of these different mindsets as the context depends, just so long as you don't mix them up, right? So you have a couple of different, these different models, that first one, the handoff one, the second one, something like a kind of ever-present model or a sort of two-standpoint model of hope or history. Um, I wanted to note the difference between these because this was confusing for me. Um, but uh, regardless of this difference, I think it is also the case that the old question essay shows that neither model of hope can work. Neither way of envisioning the work of providence or nature actually ends up being sustainable. So why, right? Okay. So if you're looking at that old question essay and you're reading through it, it initially seems like Kant is actually going to be priming you for this idea that we need to rely on the standpoint of nature and providence to get hope, right? We'll be thinking about the work that nature and providence doing is sh to shore up this mechanism of inclination. It seems like then all we need, right, if we're getting so demoralized by the evil and the folly in the world, is just this change of perspective, right? Step back, think about how you could think of nature or providence as having made the situation for the better. Feels like he's gonna embrace that, take a change of perspective idea. So he says, um, if the course of human affairs seems senseless to us, perhaps it lies in a poor choice of position from which we regard it. Viewed from the earth, the planets sometimes move backwards, sometimes forwards, sometimes not at all. But if the standpoint selected is the sun, an act which only reason can perform, according to the Copernican hypothesis, they move constantly in their regular course, right? Feels like he's about to say, take a change in perspective if you want to shore up hope. But then he denies exactly that. So to continue, right? He says, but, and this is precisely our misfortune, we are not capable of placing ourselves in this position when it is a question of the prediction of free actions. For that would be the standpoint of a providence which is situated beyond all human wisdom and which likewise extends to the free actions of the human being. These actions, of course, the human being can see but not foresee with certitude because in the final analysis, the human being requires coherency according to natural laws, but with respect to his future free actions, he must dispense with this guidance or direction. And what's strange here is, of course, not the insistence that our actions are radically free and cannot be foreseen, right? He always said that. But what is strange here is that in his earlier writings on hope, he said that while also saying that the standpoint of providence was immensely helpful, right? Um, and so it's just very weird, right? He's always consistent that we could have never inhabited that standpoint, right? We can't cognize the world through that standpoint. But he always thought, yeah, prior to 19, 1797, you need to refer to that standpoint to shore off hope. Both when he would talk about that kind of handoff model, where the work of providence or nature is restricted more to the past, and when he would talk about that kind of ever-present or standpoint model, where you sort of continually refer back to nature or providence in moments where you're just feeling despairing. And so it's very strange, right? It seems like we would see that want that to manifest again, but he's now saying that that perspective can no longer help us, right? It does not actually fortify hope. And I think actually kind of weirdly, his reasoning is really straightforward, right? Um, an appeal to providence does not give you confidence that human beings themselves will use their freedom well. 
right? It just simply doesn't do that. He does admit that an appeal to providence can give you a sort of coherent sense of how uh, the progress of humanity might be looking over time. The appeal to providence can satisfy some sort of like theoretical itch, but nonetheless, when it comes to the point of like occupying the space where we're thinking about our future free actions, we dispense with this guidance or direction at all, he says. And when I think in a nutshell that Kant is just like realizing then in 1797 is that we really need a sort of tight fit between what we're basing our hope on and what we're trying to do in the future, right? To put it in a kind of really like tidy way, um, the things that we're seeing in the past, if they're gonna give us confidence about our future, the things we're looking at there have to look like the things we're gonna wanna do in the future, right? So he's demanding a much tighter fit than he demanded before between what we're gonna be trying to do in the future through our action and what sort of things he's looking at through the theory of hope. And so then in short, right, the problem is when hope for a better future rested on these ideas about a mechanism of selfish inclination, we just don't get hope in ourselves and our agency. And I don't think he recognized really this fit problem prior to 1797, um, but when he starts talking about how hope in progress rests on a contemporary event of our making, that seems to be a kind of recognition, yeah, this fit issue is really serious. And when we then look to an event, right, um, even if it's really short-lived, it at least gives us the kind of assurance we need, right? And so that's gonna be a much, much more, um, as he puts it actually too, this was a, a really nice passage from the Theory and Practice essay, he had said there at one point, what we really want in a theory of hope is a theory that is both moving and instructive. And I feel pretty confident that a theory is only actually going to be moving and instructive if it's pointing us to things that we ourselves are doing, as opposed to a kind of mechanism of selfish inclination overseen by providence. Um, and I also want to try to posit that one thing that I think is really good about this kind of shift in Kant's thought. My personal sense is always that when I would look at some of those pre-1797 writings, I would find myself sometimes just really unable to sort of shake the feeling that Kant sometimes inadvertently diminished our sense of our own responsibility for our future. A couple passages where he seemed to do that. From theory and practice, he says, our immeasurably distant success will depend not so much on what we do, but instead on what human nature will do in and with us to force us onto a track we would not readily take of our own accord. Or another from perpetual peace, right? Reason is revered, but impotent in practice. And so instead we need to find hope in self-seeking inclinations. And I know that he was always saying those things um, from the perspective of thinking about hope, as opposed to the perspective of trying to think about action or deliberation. Mm -hmm. But I just think it's counts, it does not count in favor of a theory of hope if we have to be that tidy with our commitments. If in the moments when you're like thinking about like your despair, you have to have one set of views. And in the moment where you're transitioning to act, you have to have another, right? What do we of course know from Kant? We are vulnerable human beings. We like to transgress boundaries. We have trouble helping it. Um, so I don't know why we would ever want a theory of hope that would require us to be so neat and tidy in our commitments and avail ourselves of certain ideas about how nature is directing us only in some contexts and not others. This is not to try to say that like a two standpoint kind of thing isn't good in other contexts. Maybe you totally need it in metaphysics or epistemology. Maybe it's indispensable there. Maybe it even comes naturally for us there. But I just think that in this context of hope, I'm not sure we want to be able to um, insist on, you can only have these ideas or only be thinking of this when you're trying to shore up hope. And then you think about these totally different things when you're trying to act. I think a much more sort of um, harmonious account would be for the better. And I, I do think that Kant realizes that at, in 1797. Thanks. Yes. Yeah, thank you for the talk. Um, I 
what if you ask something about the concept of capitalism? Yeah. And because I was wondering, is it the argument that you um, say the state of hot art is against mechanism with the this funny balance of power passage? Yeah. Concept. Yeah. And I was wondering, um, so I could totally see how the idea is something like, oh, people just act on their relations, and then as it so happens, um, their, I don't know, their forces cancel each other out, and yeah. then it's nice for the time being. But I thought, that we, could you contrast that with something like um, the US Constitution, <laughs> where, um, I mean, maybe more has to, I mean, I don't want to say this is uh, the last word here, but uh, as the story goes, I mean, it's not the American military country. <laughs> as positive about this as possible. And the idea is that there you have a, a rational arrangement of how, the, um, through the um, division of powers, the forces, as it were, cancel each other out and therefore mm -hmm. allow for something more to develop than just people acting on their self selfish inclinations. So I was wondering whether that would be a different kind of mechanism than the one where basically out of happenstance, the forces just cancel each other out, and the, and the latter would be more. Uh, basically, more. Oh. You, you got a soundtrack <laughs> for your question. <laughs> I, yeah, so tell me if I missed anything there um, at the end of that. Um, Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He used my phone. He said, he said it was. <laughs> 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 Long story short, yeah. Pakistan's mechanism and rationally arranged mechanism. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I think that seems right. Um. So that's an interesting question. Like if we had found ourselves kind of uh, trying to um, think some other way that this mechanism worked that seemed like more stable or more sort of in line with the way that we um, achieve a sort of balance of powers in a kind of within a government, right? In an intergovernmental way, would that be uh, a sort of a better way to think mechanism or a way to hold on to that view. So yeah, I mean, that is, right? Like part of what makes the idea of the um, inclinations being put in such a balance or, you know, Europe being put in such a balance is that they're totally chaotic things, right? The, our inclinations shift all the time. They take on different degrees of strength for us in ways that are not really predictable um, within uh, Europe, right? The same thing would hold where um, just the, the geopolitics of the day would not lend itself to that, any sort of stable arrangement. Obviously, like the way that a kind of mechanism would be worked out in a constitution would be better. So I think, yeah, that, that would be less fanciful um, but inclinations certainly don't seem to admit of that sort of more stable arrangement, right? They do seem to seem as though they would only be conceived as coming into harmony um, in a way that is, you, you, could, you can't, and like his point in that passage too is like, God, who the hell knows who, how that could happen? It's just that it's not demonstratively impossible, right? And so that's just not, doesn't give a lot to like, a lot to rest your confidence on, right? Not demonstratively impossible is a pretty weak position. So I, I wouldn't find it, I wouldn't find that a way to go, especially I would just say like, when there's an alternative available, right? Which is look at an event of our own making. Right, I mean, I guess it could be an event of our own making, the, the rational range. Oh, okay, good, good. Okay, so then, so then you're already, I think, really moving toward me. Right, because then we're already thinking about this as something we've done. Then this would actually sort of like like one of the things that seems to be important for Kant about the French Revolution is both the way that since we're seeing it live, we have this really active sense of sympathy that's like quite a good guide for us, but it's also something about what they're doing, right? They're trying to set up a kind of Republican form of government. And so it's the object of our sympathy seems to be important there too. So I think by the time you've conceded that a little bit, 
right? That's not kind of this sort of like, just not demonstratively impossible thing that nature or providence is working out. And it's, it's something of our own making, as you just indicated, I feel like we're already now then on the same page. So even if it's a mechanism, that's a very different kind of mechanism. Yeah, cool, thank you, that's very helpful. Kristen? Yeah, so much. oh, yeah. sorry. <laughs> I think yeah, yeah you will. Yes. Uh, I, I guess we only have one more question. If that's right, I thought I defer. I really like to hear Andrew's question. I think more than my own. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. Wow. Thanks. Um, yeah. I mean, no, I really enjoyed this. I think it's a great talk. I guess I just don't see why it's about hope. It sounds like often you tend to use phrases like confidence, expectation, uh, like about putting okay. our faith in, and so yeah. forth. It's like a lot. I mean, there are passages in theory and practice where he'll articulate what looks like a very minimalist theory of hope where it's like unless I can be absolutely certain that we won't get what we want, yeah. I can hope. So the criteria does seem to be seem to be something like not demonstrably possible. And like in our discussion with the yeah, philosophy right, of religion yeah. yesterday, we're talking about how does the change of heart yet work. Yeah. And it looks like we just need some account of how it's not certain to be impossible in order to have hope. So I was just wondering whether you need Something That's more helpful. specific, like yeah. robust, motivating hope, or, okay, good. or just confidence or faith or something like that, in order to motivate moving away from a more capacious yeah. possibility. That's helpful. I would probably need to think about that a little bit more. I mean, my general inclination is to think that um, that sort of really minimalist sense of hope is is just so philosophically emaciated that I really wouldn't want to work with it much to begin with. Um, I mean, like we, yeah. we cling to these things, hoping against hope that they're true, and that's enough. Yeah, I, it's not for me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we want faith, or we want confidence, so, so it's just. Yeah, I, I just, yeah, I, I, I lean toward. I guess I'm in probably more on independent philosophical yeah. grounds, um, a theory of hope that is. Um, yeah, more like what you would have called the robust or the motivating hope. Um, and I, I guess maybe also a little bit of that is like, I don't find myself really well able to differentiate. Um, and maybe this is a good thing, maybe this is a problem, but I don't know how to well differentiate. I mean, the whole reason Kant ever seems to write on history is for the sake of us orienting ourselves in the future and feeling good about that, right? And in his philosophy of history, he definitely seems to have a theory, want to argue that a philosophy of history needs to be, as he says in the theory of in practice essay, moving and instructive. And that does seem like something then that is going to push us toward having um, a, a higher standard for vetting the objects of hope than just not demonstrably possible. Yeah, I think that's really right. And I, I mean, I know Rachel Zucker has a little bit on this. Like, I know she's even written that, like, some people just have hope and others don't, you know? And so I think one thing that I also like then after reading that was sort of thinking that would be really nice was be like, well, I, I think that's right. I think she's right in some like really deep way. But I also think like, there's a little bit more volunteerism with that than she might admit. And wouldn't it be kind of nice if we could sort of like steer people in a direction that feels a bit more affirmative. And then the, the old question essay sort of does that for me, like, because it points you to something that's so live and present and sensual. Um, yeah. Okay. So thank you very much. Thank you. Awesome. Sweet, sweet. Okay, good. And the clips forward there. Can I uh, have it? On both? Yes, he's doing it. Oh, Just a okay, because it's not. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, I see. Oh, it takes a while. Okay. Okay. 
Yes, it's okay. Okay. So, and please introduce you our next speaker, Pierre Keller from the University of California, Riverside. And his talk will be on Kant, the beautiful soul, and the eros of the evil. Okay, so um, this is a talk uh, that's really summarizing some of the stuff that I take Kant uh, to develop to. And in, in a uh, way, my whole point is that there's a whole lot more in Kant's uh, philosophy than most people realize. Uh, so I don't mean to downgrade Kant's philosophy of physics or any of that, I just see uh, Kant's conception as much more inclusive than that. So we have to uh, be able to account for all of it, also to understand Kant's influence in his time. Uh, so uh, I don't take Kant's view ever to have been static. Already in the um, critical period, um, uh, there are uh, immense transformations that uh, go on between uh, where Kant is in 1781 uh, and where he is in 1797. Uh, and one of the things that I think is really important to understand about Kant's view in the critical uh, period is that in 1781, uh, Kant has no encompassing account of human agency. He has a story about the rationality of agency, uh, an agency guided by uh, platonic ideas. Uh, he does not have an account of how feeling, desire, and uh, uh, emotions uh, fit into that account. Uh, so uh, in the first critique, uh, basically, everything that belongs to the affective dimension of human beings is relegated to psychology, empirical psychology. And that's why Kant, at that point, talks about anthropology as empirical psychology. Now, it's very different, actually, uh, 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 by... Uh, 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 Kant's late writings and the Kant's anthropology from a pragmatic point of view is often understood uh, by the lights of an anthropology that Kant no longer has when he publishes that work. Uh, so Kant, by the time he writes the anthropology, has, and he published it himself, he edited it himself. So it's some of Kant's final writings, as is the conflict of the faculties. Uh, so there Kant uh, presents a systematic account of anthropology, which he ascribes to pure uh, philosophy. And uh, on my reading, uh, this is actually uh, a fulfillment of Kant's uh, ambition to provide a transcendental anthropology, something that was impossible for Kant in 1781. Now that transcendental anthro anthropology uh, addresses the four fundamental uh, questions. And that is why uh, you only find reference to the fourth question in uh, Kant's uh, edited, not by himself, yet a logic from much later, because uh, Kant cannot uh, conceive of uh, anthropology in 1781 uh, in the way that he does later as part of, and indeed a summary of 
the cosmopolitan conception of philosophy and the unification of the question, what can I know, what ought I to do, and for what can I hope? Um, so uh, Kant takes uh, anthropology uh, in uh, the preface to the uh, anthropology from a pragmatic point of view to be a science and one belonging uh, to pure philosophy. And it's in this context that I want to take up some really surprising uh, claims that uh, Kant makes in his discussion of uh, the beautiful in the anthropology. But to backtrack uh, to the significance of this, I have to go back to Kant's response to Friedrich Schiller's objections uh, to Kant's view in Anmut und Würde. So uh, you can read part of the uh, account of uh, the beautiful uh, in the anthropology as a response to Friedrich Schiller's criticism, just as he had earlier responded to it in um, the uh, religion within the limits of pure reason alone. Okay, but the notion of a beautiful soul uh, goes back in Kant himself, and it was a commonplace uh, in the 18th century um, uh, to the critique of judgment. Uh, in the critique of judgment, Kant introduces a distinction between uh, the intellectual and the uh, narrowly social and empirical interest in the beautiful. And that's actually a standing distinction in Kant. So uh, you find this puzzling claim of Kant that goes uh, way back and is never given up that, um, in, uh, that uh, empiri the empirical uh, interest in the uh, beautiful is always a social one and one that is based on the desire to impress others. So he says things like, well, nobody's going to, uh, uh, you know, set up their house in a fine way just to please their wife or children, uh, which is very weird, but uh, they only do it really to impress other people. Now, th this has a background actually in Plato. So Plato's critical attitude toward uh, uh, common sense, uh, the common sense role of aesthetics is always about its role in uh, reproducing uh, what is publicly uh, demanded of one and thus uh, stabilizing social illusions. And that's where Kant is coming from too, through Rousseau. Uh, but Kant also recognizes that uh, it's possible to transcend this merely social interest in the beautiful. And like Plato, he thinks that uh, the way to do that is to find a way of emancipating yourself from uh, social pressures. Where Kant sees this is in the ability of a person to commune with nature independent of uh, social demand. So that's where that comes from in Kant. And that's why he identifies that with uh, showing signs of having a beautiful soul and uh, having a disposition to a, a moral conviction. A lot of these things in Kant are perfectly comprehensible if you only understand uh, they are rich historical and social context. So my overall view is that Kant is much more conversant with uh, a culture uh, than most people realize. Uh, so uh, Kant uh, prizes uh, natural beauty above uh, social uh, taste because uh, natural beauty for him allows one to emancipate uh, oneself from the general uh, concern for uh, social 
uh, recognition that he takes to underlie uh, beauty uh, or the experience of the aesthetic and especially fashion in most social contexts. Uh, so it's a way for Kant to find oneself uh, to what um, uh, Plato calls popalon, uh, 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 th that which is truly beautiful and that which is uh, uh, one with the good. Um, and Kant uh, sees this in the grounds of social uh, relations, a priori grounds that are uh, based in the very uh, principles that ground uh, subjectivity. So Kant uh, begins to develop this new conception already in the second critique, right? So uh, after the first critique, Kant uh, begins to see uh, the possibility of returning to a view that he had previously had, namely that there is a, a conception of pleasure and satisfaction that is uh, independent of uh, your empirical uh, psychological state. Uh, uh, for Kant, uh, true pleasure, as for Plato, is an experience of an unhindered agency that one uh, uh, can only have by abstracting from the uh, attractions of purely uh, sensible pleasure. Uh, so what one needs to remove those things, re uh, undermine uh, the uh, pull of uh, incentives uh, in one. And uh, for Kant, that's a key uh, uh, role for the notion of respect. So Kant thinks of respect as a feeling um, of the consciousness of the authority of the moral law that also gives you a motive to find a satisfaction in the realization of your uh, moral autonomy that um, involves your participating uh, with others in a shared sense of going on and doing things together with others. And to the extent that that uh, activity is unhindered by uh, inclinations, you find a satisfaction in a higher sense of yourself, a sense of yourself, however, that's not isolated from your participation in the kingdom of ends. So what you, you're abstracting from your sensible inclination, but at the same time, you find a higher satisfaction in your participating as who you truly are, your authentic self in a self that's together with the rest of nature and the rest of humanity in a, a harmonious context of ends. Okay, so that is, on my uh, view, also the grounding systematic principle that begins to operate across uh, Kant's whole uh, philosophy from then onward. So it constitutes, through the highest good, the condition for the possibility of all experience. And, and this conception uh, allows Kant to view uh, aesthetic uh, uh, pleasure in two different senses. First, as uh, uh, pleasure motivated by fashion and uh, regard for others, it's purely uh, um, sensible. Uh, but there's another kind of aesthetic pleasure that Kant uh, puts front and center, which frees one from the pattern of satisfaction and really dissatisfaction that Kant, like Plato, uh, takes to be characteristic of all sensible uh, pleasures. And so you come to have this sense of satisfaction in what you do together with others that allows you uh, to free yourselves from the attractions of sensibility and free yourselves from those dissatisfactions. Uh, so, uh, uh, for Kant, uh, the, this feeling of social pleasure 
is, as it is for Plato, uh, uh, the possibility of uh, finding release from the pressures of fashion, the pressures of uh, uh, your sensible desires in a way of going on together that's no longer hierarchically related as for Kant, uh, all fashion is, and also is no longer pri uh, just privately interested as your uh, inclinations are. So Kant emphasizes actually that taste is a faculty of making social judgments of external objects within the power of the imagination. Here the mind feels its freedom in the play of images, therefore of sensibility. For sociability with other human beings presupposes freedom, and this feeling is pleasure. So uh, in this uh, passage from the anthropology, Kant really explicitly says that it's in your uh, feeling, uh, your sense of freedom from uh, desire and so on, and going on together with others that you then uh, find uh, the distinctive pleasure that's aesthetic pleasure. So on my uh, uh, reading, uh, aesthetic pleasure is for Kant a pleasure that we can only achieve when we've detached ourselves from the pull of immediate interest and inclination and when we find satisfaction, uh, when we find pleasure in going on together with others. So in this conception then, uh, it, it's not, and, and I'll show you uh, that that's not a widely held view. It's not that uh, you start from your pleasure and go to other people's, it's that you get rid of the pleasure that is distinctively yours in the sense of a sensible and go to a pleasure that you have as an expression of your authentic sen sense of self, but only as going on together with others. Okay. So um, Schiller uh, famously developed a conception of the uh, beautiful soul in Anmut und Würde, grace and dignity, and that has nothing to do with Christian grace, right? Uh, I've had some people misunderstand that. Okay, so uh, Schiller develops a conception of the beautiful soul in Anmut und Würde to plug what he takes to be a gap in uh, Kant's conception of moral uh, motivation. Uh, he uh, bases this conception, and this comes up in both passages in Kant, on a, a, a double role that um, uh, Schiller assigns to Venus in uh, human life. So there's the uh, Venus that's acquired, and uh, then there's the Venus that's a natural, attractive power. And, and Schiller explicitly associates Anmut with Venus. Uh, so uh, it, it's Schiller's way of making the point that uh, Venus is always tied to uh, natural inclinations, even if they're uh, then uh, made more sophisticated by acquired uh, forms of inclination. Now, uh, Kant uh, uh, recognizes the difficulties of uh, uh, Schiller's account. Schiller wants to say, look, uh, we can fix what is broken in Kant's account of moral motivation by adding to the idea of moral motivation, the idea that uh, uh, often, uh, you're motivated by uh, inclinations. And so in Schiller's view, you, you might even have an inclination to duty. Uh, and what Schiller says is that the beautiful soul isn't really motivated by uh, uh, morality at all, by duty at all, and can even act in a way that goes against the demands of uh, 
of morality and of duty. Um, so uh, Schiller's account, I think, is uh, uh, very confused. And I guess that's why it's uh, uh, received so much uh, praise in the Kant literature. Uh, but um, uh, uh, Schiller uh, wants to uh, assign uh, to uh, action uh, a motive that can come just from inclination. He thinks Kant's idea that uh, uh, action is always, if uh, moral, based on reason, uh, a, Sch Schiller finds that problematic. Uh, I mean, Schiller initially takes the um, uh, beautiful soul to act in ways that can even go contrary uh, to duty. Uh, but then uh, Schiller ultimately com comes to the idea that the drives and inclinations that motivate the beautiful soul uh, are even drives and inclinations that we only take it as if the beautiful soul had them. And then what is actually operative in the beautiful soul is character. So that's where I take Kant to take over here. Kant sees that uh, he can uh, accomplish everything that uh, Schiller wants without the incoherence of Schiller's position. Uh, uh, and first I'll uh, discuss uh, Kant's response, and then I'll come to uh, his uh, own development of the uh, uh, beautiful soul. So in the um, passage in Anmut on, uh, I'm sorry, in the response in the religion, he doesn't actually uh, address the notion of the beautiful soul as he does later on. Uh, so Kant does argue in this footnote, which is really rich, uh, that uh, uh, we can't base a conception of the good and of the beautiful on uh, an inclination-based disposition as Schiller wants to do. Uh, but he, Kant also has a response to Schiller's never uh, actually given up claim against Kant's ethics that uh, um, Kant demands a monkish life. So Kant uh, uh, argues that if one were to base uh, the case on duty alone, then Schiller might reasonably charge him with requiring the hermit lifestyle of a Cartesian monk. But he goes on to maintain that if one looks at virtue as the firm commitment to duty, then the picture changes, for the life of virtue is one that shows a happy commitment to the moral law. So uh, Kant's idea is that um, uh, before you can prepare the basis for an adequate ac account of uh, the role of love in uh, human culture and life and the role of the arts, uh, you have to uh, provide a rational basis for this and, that, and a basis in the accomplishment of um, uh, moral and political uh, self-responsibility. That's why he says the graces, which embody the notion of Anmut in uh, Schiller, are not capable of the tough work of ethical transformation that's required of Hercules Musagetes, Hercules, the leader of the Muses. Hercules can only become Musagetes, the leader of the Muses, after completing his work of virtue. So the Muses and the Graces accompany Hercules after his tough work of ethical choice and character transformation is done. And this is a direct response to Schiller. What? Uh, oh, okay, sorry. Yeah. Uh, 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 maybe I should. If I had, yeah, so uh, what, what Kant uh, emphasizes is that um, the, uh, the good exercises a fundamentally 
attractive power uh, on us through uh, feeling. And, and uh, this uh, becomes then the, the basis for a notion of social normativity and the turning around of the whole soul uh, to the beautiful and the good in uh, Kant's final works that makes a systematic anthropology a priori possible and a conception of the cultural and Geisteswissenschaften possible. Um, so uh, uh, Kant um, takes uh, the beautiful uh, soul then in the anthropology to involve the notion of uh, uh, an expression uh, which, of which everything can be said uh, to make one aim at the innermost union with such a soul. And uh, for Kant, this is the idea that uh, the concept of beauty carries with it the concept of an invitation to the most intimate union with the object, that is, the immediate enjoyment. Uh, the goodness of soul that's characteristic of the beautiful soul is primordial, pr primordially created, but also supernatural, like the eros of fable. That's Kant. Uh, uh, so uh, Kant's uh, view is that um, uh, we're capable because the beautiful soul and beauty is grounded in the good of realizing an attractive power to uh, the true nature of ourselves that uh, allows us to overcome all uh, natural objects. Now, um, I, I, so I want to say that the notion of uh, individual here yeah, is preserved in this experience. Your true authentic nature is captured, but you become unified with the good and the beautiful, and you strive for that. Uh, I'll skip to uh, the just the final thing. Do I have? Yeah, yeah okay. So um, there are a couple passages in leading interpreters of uh, Kant, which I think are just incapable of understanding what Kant is about here. Uh, I'll just start with uh, Nehemus's general claim that um, uh, the, despite the nuances and uh, uh, complications of Kant's position, uh, it is now almost an article of faith that the end of our interaction with the arts comes only when we're positioned to make a vacuum judgment of value, and he thinks the position of judgment and criticism is in real conflict with the place of beauty in art. So um, let me just, uh, the way that um, Nehemus and Geyer and many others interpret uh, the claim from the anthropology about beauty and about the beautiful soul uh, actually completely mischaracterizes what Kant said. Uh, so this is um, uh, the, uh, the claim. Beauty brings with it the concept of the invitation to the most infinite, intimate unification with the object that is to immediate enjoyment. And uh, th this is now from Nehemus. Paul Geyer has pointed out that the anthropology from a pragmatic point of view, paragraph 67, expresses what he calls a striking variation on the third critique theme of a universal voice that speaks with a claim to everyone's consent. Kant describes the judgment of beauty as an invitation, Einladung to others to experience the pleasure one has oneself felt in an object. Nehemus then continues, that's a wonderful way of putting the point, although I am not sure that Kant offers here a variation and not an entirely new and independent thing. And then Ted Cohen says of this, an uh, aesthetic judgment is an invitation to others to take something seriously, to make a part of what gives their life the pleasure it has. And Nehemus objects to that. Aesthetic 
Judgment, I believe, never commands universal agreement, and neither a beautiful object nor a work of art ever engages a Catholic community. So uh, the whole terms of this debate uh, are really striking in their uh, complete inability to make sense of Kant's passage and to read back into it their own uh, presupposition. When you start with your likes and dislikes, you try to project that onto others, and you can never achieve universal agreement for that. So my view uh, of what Kant is doing throughout the critical works is the exact opposite. If, if you start from your private subjective experience and try to get to others, uh, you're doomed from the start. Uh, in the first critique, in the second, in the third. You've got to start from a transformation in your character, which involves looking at things not from your private point of view, but from the vantage point of your sense that who you truly are involves an adjusted relation to all of nature, to all other beings in which you find uh, who you are in participating in projects that others can participate in as well. And that involves, a, in the end, a complete transformation, both of thought uh, and of uh, feeling and desire. And that's what Kant envisions in his idea of a beautiful soul as something with which one strives for the most intimate union. To become a beautiful soul is to become this unity of thought, feeling, and desire which is in perfect conformity with nature and with other human beings. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, thanks, Gary. Yeah, that was great. Um, I like a lot of what you have to say. Um, I kind of wanted to, it's not a very welcome question, but I wanted to invite you to say something right. about another play called, well, a thing that does come up, which is the theme of, the theme of love, right? So yeah. Also would be, the Schiller put on the religion, which I agree is awesome and super rich. Um, there is a need like love for the good. I think love like very well captures even in the platonic picture the right. unions that you're talking about. Yeah. And I guess I'm well one, just an invitation to say more about that. But I'm also wondering there it's the like love for the good, which is being with the good. And in the beginning of your talk, especially we're really emphasizing like going along with others. Right. And the kind of love for others, while I think I want it to be the case, yeah. I don't know if it's ever explicitly said, and I wonder if you can. You know, can you get us there? Is that something you think is part of Kant's big tradition? But love is really more, you know, this like platonic experience of the good, but it's not directly outwardly related to other people. No, I think it's outwardly directed to other people. I think that, you know, at, in the metaphysics of morals, for instance, Kant has a whole discussion of the role of love. Uh, and, and there are all these other passages. Most people say, well, Kant's conception is this duty thing and love plays no role. But uh, uh, Kant for a while doesn't have the resources to express a notion of uh, our own sense of uh, if our importance in relation to feelings that we ought to have for others that are inclusive. And, and so uh, I take it actually that uh, the critical period uh, involves Kant's uh, process of reproducing the Platonism uh, from which he had started in 1770. Yeah, right? So there are all of these problems that Kant perceived with the notion of uh, the self, world, and uh, God, and, and those seem to prevent him from getting back to uh, the, the Platonic uh, conception that he had before, and in particular, they made it seem like desire, feeling, all that's just psychology. Uh, but the mature Kant sees that, no, those things are the basis for the possibility of experience. So there's no experience uh, without a priori feeling, desire, and so on. And I would even say without love. Martin. Yeah, uh, great. Uh, thanks for the very rich talk. Um, I, um, I, at, at the beginning and then towards the end, you said that anthropology is a priori part of pure philosophy. Mm -hmm. I'm really skeptical of that. Um, just because Kant is struggling 
to even accommodate some of their chemistry as part of um, as part of pure philosophy. For most of his life, it's not important. <laughs> then towards the end, in the Opus Postumum, he switches and basically says chemistry can be reduced to physics and mathematics. So it is a priori. So how, how would anthropology be a priori? And I don't deny that kind of he says it somewhere, but he, I, I just, it, most of the stuff that he talks about in, in, in his anthropology seems to be so outside of the area of pure philosophy that I, I, I don't see how yeah. it could be. Well, I disagree. Uh, sure. So, so yeah. Um, so first remark, uh, yes. Kant um, works hard, and the passage that you uh, refer to is from the Critique of Practical Reason. Kant's uh, view is uh, one that evolves. He doesn't have the resources at the time he writes the Critique of Practical resource, uh, Reason that he has when he writes the Anthropology. This is the culmination of a, an another decade of thought in which Kant is working ceaselessly to integrate all of this stuff. And if you look at, you, that was my point also about the notion of anthropology from the uh, 1781. You can't project it uh, then back to Kant's position 17 years later. I mean, his theory has undergone vast uh, systematic transformation. None of it uh, marks a break with anything that he thought before, but he finally gets all of these things online. So I see Kant in the Opus Postumum too as executing a project that goes back to the free critical Kant. It's just that as he develops more and more resources, he can put those into play. Oh, and the other point about the uh, content of the anthropology. So uh, it, it depends on how you read the a priori. So I don't read the a priori as deducing from uh, a logical or synthetic a priori principle. I read a priori as a, uh, systematically related in a structure that you can't get just from experience because experience itself has a systematic structure that as Hume showed, you can't get from experience. That's Kant's point all along. I mean, people just project onto Kant their own inductivist uh, and basically um, fail attempts to ground things like induction. So I've read all of the literature on induction, and you can't do it from empiricist principles. Uh, thank you so much, Pierre. So first of all, it's not a real philosophy conference unless there's some Plato. So I appreciate you participating <laughs> our, our three days. I, I, I love that. Um, uh, really, just quick speculative question. Um, what do you think about the ideal of beauty? Uh, that discussion of the third critique that would seem to have real resonances with yeah. this uh, picture you're outlining here. Yeah, so yeah, um, yeah, that's where Kant is uh, looking at um, uh, the relation between this, this standard of beauty provided by uh, uh, the Toriforon uh, and, and trying to add to that a moral dimension. Uh, so I don't want to say that all beauty takes that form because there's a, a role in my view uh, to uh, abstract art as it were, or just the patterns uh, uh, to uh, jungles in Kant. Uh, uh, but uh, there's something that connects both, a sense of pattern that we can't make explicitly explicitly articulate to it ourselves, but that we grasp in terms of the way it's connected to the good. And the, the, the good the, uh, that's why Kant in the critique refers to the uh, beautiful as the symbol of the good. That's right? really helpful. I just uh, hope that that question would give a little refinement to how you thought about the relationship in the end between the, the beautiful and the good in Kant, I think, I think. That's what helpful what you just said. So thank you. So there was a last question there. Um, yeah, uh, thank you. Very interesting. I mean, I was I just I wanted to uh, um, wanted to 
make Shilla as strong as possible here. And if then you can tell me whether that is not working, and then you can understand it better. Um, so it seems that you make this distinction between pleasures. There are mm -hmm. the immediate natural pleasures, and mm -hmm. there's this zero sum game, um, as Plato says in the Thalibus. Um, and then there is the more refined pleasures. I was wondering, so could we not do the same? Or it seems that something similar could not be going on with um, uh, Schiller, that we make the difference between inclinations. There are the natural ones and then the refined ones. And it seems, I'm wondering, so do we not just have a disagreement about what exactly Kant and Schiller each focus on? It seems that Schiller, so I don't know how exactly Schiller argues, but it seems that it's at least possible that the culturally refined inclination would involve what you say Kant ultimately argues for. It's possible that well, it could be contained in it, unless Schiller really precloses it and says, no, this is... This yeah, is he does, but... So he does, but uh, my point is actually that Kant is not juxtaposing natural to culturally refined pleasures. That's what... That's the... Uh, distinction that Kant in the end finds pointless. Kant thinks that there's a distinction to be drawn uh, between both of those and uh, pleasures that arise from our going on, our sense of satisfaction in going on together. But couldn't we say the last is part of the culturally acquired, then they're the good case of culture. No, that, that's Kant's point about uh, having to first perform the task of Hercules before uh, he can become the leader of a music. So my downstream point is that Kant's view is preparing the way for a scientific uh, account of the Geisteswissenschaften. Uh, of, of uh, an account of how all of this could have an a priori basis because it involves a uh, transformation in our social characters where we no longer see um, a culture as an extension of the uh, uh, culture that Rousseau despises, but instead of the autonomy that Rousseau praises. Right, and again, there's a further point of Kant, which Kassir, I think, rightly takes to be a hallmark of the German tradition, namely that Kant, from the get-go, sees our, one's identity as an individual human being and one's going on together as inseparable from each other. And if you separate that, then you've got it, Kant. Okay. I'm sorry, we really had yeah. to, to stop. Thank you very much.